We're starting. Yes, indeed. We are. We are. We're going to learn tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so tonight we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to actually explore the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Quick Map Browser. And as you look on the screen here, you can see that there's a lot going on. We have an awful lot. You know what? It's saying poor network connection for yeah. our Skype. Oh. I don't know why. Because I wonder I've which got... one of us is poor. I'm all green. Is it saying it on your end? I'm all green on my end. I don't have a poor connection. Oh, wait. Yeah, it's it's Skype. Yeah, and the Skype itself. Oh. Well, That's weird. Yeah, I'm not getting any problems. Mm -hmm. So, actually, leaving everybody hanging here for a moment, I'm just trying to let you know that we're going to be looking at the Quick Map browser, and we're going to be able to go playing along in LRO. Okay. That's okay. Well, maybe I should actually uh, bear with us, folks, for a minute. Maybe I should just uh, stop sharing, too. Well, then I won't be able to see nothing. Well, you can watch online, right? I can watch it on YouTube. That's what I mean. Yeah, I can do that. Just wondering if that's going to make any. If that'll save you a bandwidth or something. But it, I mean, it seems fine now. It's it's okay. everything's working good. Already. So, whatever you want to do. Sure. Well, folks, welcome to the cloudy night stream or Sky Tour live stream. As you can imagine, I have the uh, the uh, chief second in command <laughs> for PNK Space Imaging, uh, Keith, with me. <laughs> welcome, Keith. How you doing? The chief operating officer. The chief operator is in Miami, and the chief Indian is actually <laughs> Keith, who's working with uh, Paul. But yeah. the bottom line is tonight we're going to be looking at this thing. Uh, this is the moon. Now, that's that's it. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming. Uh, but the Lunar Quick Map, uh, uh, the LRO Quick Map browser is really cool because you can go in here and see the moon in unprecedented detail. Now, over here on the left side... It says switch projections. Well, you click it and it goes away and you got a full screen. If all you want to do is explore, you can go into the moon and just zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. Okay. And right now we're there at... There you go. Did you bring your audio up? Did I bring For my people? audio up? Yeah, you had uh, three people say your audio is low. Okay. Well, I can bring it up here. Just mentioning it now that way. No, no please do. Get it out of the way. Please do. How's this? And as, as, I'm guessing it's just Mark's audio. I'm guessing mine's fine from what they're saying. Well, let's wait and see. Let's find out. All right. So here is me talking this way uh, about the screen that we're looking at right now. We're looking at some cascading debris falling down into this crater. And how about Keith? Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk and so people can listen to you too? Yeah. I'm... Are, you, uh, are we level? Are we good to go? Is our audio working? <laughs> I think the audio should be working. Yeah. Bill says the audio is good there. Hello, uh, Bill, New York Skywatcher. Bill, New York Skywatcher, one of the and two And, of course, Ron and culprits. Charles and Dee Dee and Carmen and Weird Guy. Yeah. Hey, you calling me a weird guy? <laughs> uh, not out loud, anyway. Oh, okay. So, as I was saying before, we are looking at the moon in unprecedented detail with the Lunar Quick Map browser the LRO, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Browser. If you look, you don't even know what you we're looking at here until you start backing out. And you back out and you'll see all these extra little squares. This is all the many images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that have been stitched together to create this mosaic uh, that is then seamlessly integrated uh, with very high-end computing power at their end and pre uh, presented for you. Now, if you want to know how to get to this, I will show you that right away. Okay, if we go over into uh, a, a, a search, all you have to do is look up LRO Quick Map Browser, or just LRO Quick Map, like this. And then you'll get this, these results here. And then you can say, oh, well, what do we do? Let's go LRO Quick Map at Arizona State University. And look what you get. Bam. It shows up. So that's what you got to do. All right. LRO, quick map, and let's do a search. Now, back to the live browser that I'm using here. This, of course, is Play-Doh. It's 60 miles across, all right? And it's actually 
uh, visible. Uh, I mean, in any telescope, we see it all the time on, on PK, PK space imaging. Uh, we even look at it in SkyTour live stream. But over on this uh, quick map browser, we have some additional capabilities. We can zoom in, all right? And as we do, then we see the mosaic craters of the high uh, resolution passes being blended with some of the other passes, which are possibly less resolution. But look at this crater. We're zooming in on this crater. Can you see the little things in there, the little boulders? All right. Now, from experience, I can tell you that th this boulder, let's see, right about there, right where my cursor is, that boulder is about 15 feet across. All right. Wow. That's, yeah, it's pretty cool. Now, look down the bottom here, right down here at the bottom. This is telling you the latitude and longitude of your cursor, right? But it's also saying what the resolution is here, what, the, what your scale is. And it's a half meter per pixel of image. So when you look at the image, you see that it, if you look at it in, uh, uh, if you could if, if zoom in even further, you'd see it has a little bit of a blocky structure. Each one of those blocks is a pixel. And pixel stands for picture element. <clears throat> and the picture element, uh, you need many, many pixels together to make up a single picture. And that's what we got going on here. All right. We are seeing these uh, at a half meter per pixel. So when you see two little dots next to each other, well, then those two little dots next to each other make up one meter. At a hey, Mark. Half meter per pixel. Yeah. Real quick, um, just so people can get a reference. Um, do you know what year the LRO was launched and when it actually started its mission? Uh, the yellow oh, actually um, let's let's put that up that's a very good point okay if we look just up, so people get relative like how long this process actually took to map the entire moon surface and actually have it available to the way we're seeing it today yeah I think it was launched in 2009 actually but let's, that let's sounds about right but I wasn't I wasn't certain let's check it out let's look at about um, okay well first of all why don't we talk about the LRO in that regard too um, we can talk about the LRO instruments. Wow. What's that? Oh, I just saw Aristarchus pop up. That, that'll always get me. Oh, yeah. Seeing Aristarchus from the LRO because it's so crystal clear. And wait till we see it when we go on live here. Well, semi-live, right, in the uh, actual, in the stream. It looks yeah. beautiful. And as we'll see in a second, um, you know, there's a lot going on with the LRO. Um, you know, they, they have a lot of images that you can get. And this is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, obviously, the site. And it's a NASA.gov site, and you can look up at and read about how they built the spacecraft. You know, that's beyond the scope of what we're doing tonight. You can look at the instruments to see all these different things that they, the instruments do or, or are used for and are, are creating uh, you know, data for. And all of these are uh, different types of instrument packages that are giving different types of data. For instance, we want to study the mineralogy of the moon. We can do that, and I'll show you how to do that. Those are called overlays. Right, and we're just looking at basically as if we came in for the first time, just checking it out and to see, you know, what the LRO does. They actually, the LRO looks like this. This is actually a good, a good uh, image of the LRO. Uh, I actually have a 3D model of that. Um, and you see how low it looks like it is? It's like kind of, it looks like it's just right above a crater. Well, that's actually, you know, a little bit of a stylized imagery. It, it got down to about, a tw about 30 miles above the lunar surface in one orbit, and they made it do that so that it could get the high-resolution imagery, imagery of the Apollo landing sites. That's how low this thing had to get to be able to see them at all. Uh, and when you see them, because we're going to show you them, uh, you'll be amazed at just how they look because they're pretty cool. Um, so uh, this is the LRO website, and... Um, as far as, uh, let's see here. Uh, well, wait a minute. Let me go back a bit. Let me come back. Uh, it says, uh, it was, yeah, it was launched in 2009. See that? And its orbit mm -hmm. height is 31 miles. Uh, it was 60, but they lowered it to get those high resolution images that I told you about. Now, here, um, orbiting at 30 miles high would be disastrous. All right. Uh, we have to get up above 200 just to have only some atmosphere hitting us around Earth. But, of course, the moon has none, and so we get a chance to drop this probe right down near the surface. Uh, and it's very, very uh, um, helpful to be able to do that. So, back on the Lunar Orbiter Quick Map, let's zoom back out. 
and say, and look at this. This is what we get when we come in, all right? We see the whole face of the moon. Now, let's start with this guy right up here, all right? There's a whole bunch of things you can do. We're going to talk about it. First of all, we can switch the projection, like what, what are we looking at, front or the back or whatever. We can also look at the layers. This is where you're going to spend a lot of time if you're going to play, because in the layers, you can actually start to turn on and off things. You could look at the Apollo landing sites through here. You can search for them here. Uh, you also have uh, Boolean capabilities, which we're not going to talk about tonight. You can actually you know, add and subtract layers to actually find specific data. This tool we're going to talk about, this is the query tool. This tool is one that will allow you to like draw a line and figure out how big a crater is and then see the profile of how that crater shape goes from the side so you can see how deep it goes and you get the exact values that, are, that were recovered. Uh, you can search for uh, products, but these are data products, so... The search is a little misleading here, and we'll talk about that, okay? Uh, these others are settings, and of course, uh, toggle the full screen. Now, if I want to go to full screen here, I'm just going to do this, okay? And this is where we're going to stay for part of the uh, stream. Now, if we go back to switch projections, all right, these are what we have. We have the orthographic far side, all right? We have the orthographic near side, which is what this is. It's, it's highlighted in blue, okay? And that's this, the side we're familiar with. Then we have this guy here. Called, it's called Equidistant Cylindrical. And this is uh, a map which actually is a rectangular map of the entire moon. Now, on the uh, U.S. geological uh, sites, like uh, the USGS sites where you have moon data, uh, those are the maps they use. So <clears throat> that's why they're shown here, because that's a, a map that many people doing uh, structural mapping stuff uh, will use. I use that, for instance. But I won't use it here because... The moon is a sphere. <laughs> I like using it as one. And then we have this South Pole and North Pole images. Uh, and actually, they're, they're, when they say orthographic, it means that they're looking at it directly from, say, the South Pole or North Pole, so 90 degrees down or minus 90 degrees and then down or up, you know, looking. And so um, then you have this one, Lunar Globe 3D. And we'll look at that, too. In this one, you can actually go cruising through the craters, drop over the rim, go down into a crater, come back up out of the crater and go zooming across the top of the moon. I, I mean, this is, you'll see, this is a lot of fun. So let's start with orthographic far sites that's at the top of the list and watch the display over here change. When I hit that, you'll see now, this is the far side of the moon from, taken from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Isn't that something? And what's interesting about this is there is only two areas that have Maria, okay, and that's like this guy here, which is Sokovsky Crater, and then this guy here, which is Mare Muscoviense, which is a, a, a Maria on the far side. But I want you to notice this area over here. I've had this question before. This guy over here, this right here is the Aitken Basin. Right? The Aitken Basin is the lowest spot on the moon. And the highest spot on the moon is just right about here. Okay, but this is the lowest spot on the moon. This was a result of a massive collision by something, all right? But the contours and the perimeter of that something have been lost to time because look how many more craters were made after that impact. These craters here all occurred subsequent to the impact that caused, you know, this, this big depression. That's amazing how much more the backside of the moon is, is cratered than the front side. That's right, and let's just go back and forth for a couple seconds. This is the far side, the one that we don't see. Here's the near side, the one that we do see. Now, I've talked about this in Sky to Livestream. I've actually talked about it on, on P&K Space Imaging as well. This particular, uh, well, I guess we call it a feature or characteristic of the moon is the result of the fact that the moon was molten at one time, as was the Earth. And the latest science thinking on this is that this molten uh, moon at one point was, was sort of semi-molten, was very easily transformed back and forth from molten to cooled and back again. And during the process, when anything struck the moon, like something that made the Mare Imbrium Basin, okay, when something hit the moon very, very hard, it would make it molten like here, okay? This would be a, a molten area. But it would make a giant splash that would come off. And the Earth, being from where we're looking over here, actually obviously farther away than this, obviously, but when something hit the moon, it would go splashing up into the air. 
I say the exosphere, the area around the moon, there's no air. Um, and the infrared radiation uh, from the Earth is, has, has a strength that can be felt. When you feel the sun on your face, you're feeling the infrared radiation striking your face. Well, the infrared radiation would be striking these particles, too, and it would tend to blow them this way, all right? Blow them up and or around or just to the back side of the moon. And over billions of years, that made this side of the moon have a lot thicker crust. And when that happened, then anything that struck the moon had to really, really strike pretty heavy and pretty uh, violently and fast to make a Maria on that side, because this side of the moon is very, very, very thick compared to the front side of the moon, you know, the one we see. Now, that doesn't mean that it's very, very, very thin. It's not. It's, it's fairly thick, but the far side is actually even thicker. And that means that the moon is actually, if you want to measure, like, the center of gravity, the center of mass of the moon, uh, it's not in the center. It's actually shifted toward the back side of the moon. So that also stands to make the moon a little bit oblong, which is really interesting, too. So these two uh, projections immediately show us a whole bunch of stuff and a whole bunch of interesting data that tell us something about what happened to the moon. And this, this quandary of why this far side is all cratered and this near side is not is something that we've been wrestling with for decades and decades, actually probably... Ever since we saw the far side for the first time, uh, we've been wrestling with that. So it's really something to consider. Um, now, uh, you're hanging in there, yeah, Keith? That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just have it on mute. That way. No, no, that's okay. That's yeah. okay. That, that, I'm still here. No, no, it's fine. I'm, I know you're not going. Don't worry. I'll chime in. <laughs> well, no, I just want to make sure if you had any questions or whatever that I give fair time to, to let any. Nope, uh, just learning like the rest of them. Yeah. That's good. Um, I'm actually not seeing the chat, guys, so I probably should bring that up on the other screen um, while I'm here. So let me do that. Uh, just to... Well, you did, um, you did have a question from Laura Hovey. I okay. think Hovey is how you say it. Hi, Laura. How are you? And it did say, uh, do the poles shift on the moon? Uh, no, actually, that's that the pole shift, to, for that to shift, we'd actually have to have a magnetic field on the moon to shift. And... There is no magnetic field on the moon. Um, and to have a magnetic field, the core of the moon would have to be uh, solid or molten, uh, where an outer core is solid or molten, and they have to kind of you know, ride against each other to make electrical currents that would make a uh, magnetic field. Bottom line, the moon doesn't have a magnetic field, so there's no poles to shift, um, which is an interesting uh, facet of the lunar uh, terrain, you know, that there aren't, anything, uh, there aren't any uh, magnetic issues with the moon, no, no magnetic field to worry about. But You know what we should do at some point tonight? Okay. We should uh, zoom in to a point that usually Paul gets to, like with our really good zooms, and actually show how much farther you can go in with the LRO. I, uh, I was going to do that, actually, um, but that, that, that's fine. Um, but I, I, like I was going to look for uh, one of the particular craters we were talking about yesterday. Uh, Sweet. Yeah, and then I was going to dive in, and I think he was over here, uh, looking over here. Um, but I, uh, we'll get there, because we, we don't have to do it from an angle like this. We can do it looking directly down on top of it, which is even cooler, um, and you'll see in just a bit. Now, uh, so this, these are the two maps that already tell us some amazing things. You, you see observationally, massive difference between the back side of the moon and the near side of the moon. Okay. Now, um, this next projection is one that kind of combines both views in a rectangular uh, view. So that's this one. And this is the one, and I will just move this over for now. This is the one that uh, you'll, you'll find if you go to any geological survey sites. This is what you're going to see. You're not going to see a spherical map of the moon. Okay, You're going to see this, uh, this, this equidistant map, uh, this projection. All right, And, you know, this, this odd... Uh, th this odd stuff here is just the way that looks. Also notice that you see that some things are cut off here. That's because this only goes down to like minus 75 and uh, up here to, uh, I believe, plus 75. Okay. It's kind of like how they have to stretch maps out in the 2D. That's correct. Yeah. Right. Now, uh, when we look at Miramascoviense over here, this is on the far side like we saw. 
And this is Sokovsky Crater, all right, which we make as a 3D print. Uh, it's beautiful. And, and Sokovsky, okay, you see the data to the same level that you can see it on the spherical map, all right? So this is really cool. And if you dive in, now you can see where the LRO orbiter, uh, or the LR orbiter, came in. And watch this. We zoom in now. Look down the bottom. We're at 16 meters per pixel, all right? We zoom in more now, okay? And now we're at 8 meters per pixel. And then 4 meters per pixel. Now the rocks and boulder, bigger boulders are starting to show up. Let's focus right here. And now we can zoom in again. And now we're at two meters per pixel, all right? One meter per pixel. And notice how it takes a few seconds and then it sharpens up. You can actually see that the, you're getting these uh, stand-in graphics, which actually are not as high resolution, but then they get sharper. Are uh, they taken as like a, uh, like a TIFF image? Is that what the LR uses, the format? For it think... to be able to be zoomed like that? <laughs> Um, well, they have to have a lossless uh, image, and I'm not sure what the actual image is, but it's certainly not JPEG. Um, yeah, it's, definitely not. <laughs> it's going to be some type of raw format, most likely. Yeah, like, which I think TIFF is, isn't it? Uh, not exactly. Maybe not. Not exactly. Yeah. Um, but a raw format has its own pluses. Uh, it offers you the ability to also include some... Uh, extra high dynamic range in there that you may or may not get with a TIFF. Uh, but the bottom line is that whenever these are converted, they are generally converted to either a TIFF or a JPEG. Now, if this was converted to a JPEG, then this area over here on the right where you see this gray, you know, this, this area here would might be a problem because in a situation like that, you would probably find that the... Uh, the gray area is sort of uh, blurred out a little bit or looks blurry. Uh, and that's because the JPEG compression really wreaks havoc on, on the, uh, uh, on this. So we don't want to, we don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to use JPEGs and you can go, when you go to the LRO site, okay, you can actually download these, fo these photos in high resolution TIFF files, which is for the public consumption and, com you know, and transmission over the internet is the best, happy medium um, or you can download JPEGs you know for someone who doesn't really care so much about the you know the the quality and resolution now take a look at this now we're at a half meter per pixel in Tsiolkovsky crater on the far side of the moon okay now just watch this now let me just give you an idea here okay uh, that little rock right there is about 15 feet across that guy right there all right Okay, right over there. That's about 15 feet across right there, that square rock. All right. So as we zoom out, look how quick we lose 15 feet. Okay, this is at 2 meters per pixel. Okay, 4. Okay, 8. 16. You get it now. It goes by, you know, it doubles. So 32. Now we're seeing, uh, now we're seeing it like we, we recognize it. Uh, Sokovsky Crater. Right, and this now, of course, look at the the scale now. It's 125 meters per pixel. Every now, remember, a pixel is the tiniest part of the image, tiniest little element that makes up the image. All right, so clearly, um, the moon is a amazing place. But here's something that the LRO shows us that you would not see in earlier imagery of the moon. This is Sokovsky. I told you that the impacts on the far side had to be much more energetic to cause these maria to appear like this. Take a look. This is an apron. This is called an apron. This apron right here is ejected material. Let's zoom in. Notice the lines. This stuff was splashed out like water. You can almost see how it was just splashed out like like wet mud, so to speak. Now there was no water involved, but there was liquefaction, which is what happens when you you put a lot of energy into uh, uh, sand or dirt. Uh, it can flow like water for a, s a short period of time. But it's not water. It's not wet. It's just moving like uh, a unified liquid for a period of time. <laughs> I knew that wouldn't take long. Somebody asking about the uh, the moon landing sites too. <laughs> oh yeah, I yeah. knew that wasn't far behind. No, no. But I said at the beginning we were going to be looking at those. Yeah. So that's cool. No, that's good. Uh, I like I said uh, earlier. Uh, uh, anybody who wants to come on and challenge us about the moon landings, have at it, baby. 
Yep. Yep. I'm here. I'm here. And you can ask anything you want. Try to embarrass me. Try to make me uh, falter uh, or whatever you think is going to happen. And it just won't happen because I have science on my side. And, and that's all there is to it. But I'll be nice to you. Don't worry. I'll be nice. You know. Now Speak for yourself. Well, you may not. Oh, wait. That's right. This is your stream. I got to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank darn. You. Well, well, that's okay. Oh, darn. Yeah. Well, darn. You never know. Never know. Will, you never know. <laughs> hey, who let him in here? So, so Stilkowski looks like this. You see this apron. This is really unprecedented detail surrounding Stilkowski. Of course, going into the, the central peak. Okay, hello. Going into the central peak. Uh, I must have. I, I think I, I got rid of that for some reason. No, I didn't. It's right there. Okay. Going into the central peak of Stilkowski. Uh, is unprecedented. I mean, you zoom in, and now this is blurry, and now this is as sharp as it gets. This is the half meter per pixel. And I'm not sure if this image was taken when uh, the LRO was uh, at 31 miles or a little bit higher. Um, so there are some passes that are very, very high resolution, uh, and, and I've seen some just wondrous images. I mean, look at this boulder pile down here. This would be lost to history. No one would ever know about these big, giant boulders that are here. Okay? And when I say big, giant boulders, well, how big are they? Well, uh, we'll talk about that, and I'll show you in a little while when we start using some of the tools. But if we zoom back out now, okay, this is, again, that equidistant projection. Let's go back and use a more standard projection. Let's go back to the orthographic near side for now. So now we have it circular, but, okay... If we go up to like the place where we went like yesterday with P and K, we went up to this crater um, here and this crater here. And when Paul at P and K Space Imaging was using that spectacular setup that he has to zoom in uh, to the craters, uh, he got about was it about this close or do you think it was about this close? Keith, what do you think? Keith doesn't know. All right, I don't hear from Keith. So no, I'm I'm waiting for the YouTube to catch up so I can see what you're talking about. Oh yeah, see because I'm I'm on a delay here. Yeah, you, um, are. you are. Yeah, it was a little it was a little further out. Well, it was like this, you think? Uh, okay. and, and I got I got to wait now. Yeah. yeah. This this is a. Uh, I should probably uh, I should probably just try to uh, share my screen again. Yeah, that would probably be best. Yeah, uh, and just so uh, I'm on same time with you. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise I'm gonna wonder, you know, where are you? What's going on? And, and, and I you did... know what? I'll return the favor the next stream, and I'll try to share my screen with you as well oh, when we do well, that. That's such a nice thing. The live my screen. I think that's great. Well, it's been so good lately since the it's not using a lot of OBS because of you know I'm not sure what it was with the upgrade, but it's not using nowhere near as much of computer power as it once was. Yeah. So now I think I can get away with sharing the screen as well as you know running Skype and okay. everything else. So we should be good. All right, well, I'm going to share the screen again, and we'll see what happens. Okay. No, you're sharing the screen. And we're going. And there we go. Just like that. There we go. Sure. Okay, right. now I'm with you. Okay, yep. good. And what I'll do is I'm going to minimize a couple other things that are running that I don't need to worry about. All right, so. Um, and hello to everybody that's watching in yeah. the chat, all 36 of you, and hello to Jello. Awesome. And Driver Mark and Justin T and Amal and Odyssey and James and Justin T and Dee Dee and DJ K Solo and Melissa and Cosmic Lettuce and Dark Ricks and anybody else that I missed. Sorry, I'm Me. just running it down I'm, for Mark. I'm here too. Well, we know you're here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd hope you'd be here anyway. Yeah. And Ashley Hartman. I'm Hello. sort of here. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, so I thank thank you for doing the rundown because uh, I'm really happy to see people here tonight. This, uh, and this is what I want you to tell me now. You know, when we were looking at P&K Space Imaging last night, Keith, Keith and Paul were zooming into some craters. I mean, it was stunning. Yeah, it was just about this, just about this far. Like this? Yeah. Okay. Now, this corresponds to 125 meters per pixel. That means 125 meters every tiny little dot that makes up the picture which i might add is not bad no no i was about to add that <laughs> myself okay which is very very good for yeah, a really live great. view of the moon right mm -hmm. 
But now yep. if we want to go in and we go a little farther than 125, we can go to 64. All right. And it just embarrasses us. Well, no, no, no. It doesn't because we're looking at a I know. you know several hundred million dollar satellite versus a several well, thousand this, dollar the, telescope in a yes. parking garage in Miami. But this is what I like about this because I can go into the site if we if I see like a weird area like we did last night with that layering effect yes. like between craters. I can go on the LR quick map and look at it. That's right. Up close and personal and see exactly what's going on there and see why things would match up the way they are and why, you know, the projection of light that's would, right. would cause that kind of effect, which is really neat, I think. Yeah. So at 64 meters per pixel, we're here. Now I can go in more. And now something else happens. <clears throat> when you get to this threshold value, uh, what happens is the higher res image uh, will pop in. And those are st uh, stitched images that are stitched together to make up a logical look of this crater. See, that becomes mm -hmm. this. So you mean they're, they're not moon bases with right angles? Yeah, I know. No, huh? They're just pictures. Well, I'm sorry. And the, and they look like that because of the way the LRO scans it, right? They scan in and just short. It, it's, uh, it's scanning in swaths. Yeah, yeah, in in short swaths. That's right. And so, which is usually, um, well, I guess we could measure it to see how wide a swath is when it runs over. Because I'm guessing it's not the same every time because it's on kind of an elliptical orbit, right? Yes, LRO slightly. Itself. And you'll see that there is a slight taper to these uh, swaths at, at some points. Yeah. Okay, but let's take a look now. This is 32 meters per pixel. Now we zoom into 16, and then and then uh, eight, and then Ooh, here four, we and now look. Look at it. individual look. individual oh, wow. rocks. And by the way, this is one I wanted to show you. Notice this. This is a little trail. Wow, is that the same kind of effect that happens in Arizona? Uh, I mean Death Valley. <clears throat> yeah, is that where it is, where the rocks move by themselves? Yeah, that's a, that's caused by ice. But this is yeah. this is actually caused by the fact that this is a slope. Okay, oh. this is a crater. And now, if we zoom in, this is the highest resolution. This is half meter per pixel. You'll notice dozens and dozens of these trails going down the slope. These are areas where the rocks roll down the slope. This rock is probably over twenty feet bit and large, you know, kind of twenty feet in size. All right, and it rolled down the the slope, and you can see that it made a rather uneven roll, okay? So it shows you that it, it, it's an oblong rock that kind of tumbled end over end at times, and then came mm. the rest here. These you know what I want to point out about this image, too? all the ones that came down here, too. While you're here? Yeah. Is look how much bigger um, the shadow makes that rock look. That's correct. Like if you don't know what you're looking for. That's correct. Like, so you could see this big shadow and not realize that the thing that's casting the shadow is really small compared to the shadow itself. That's right. And if you look over here, for instance, at this rock, it's more clear about the size of the rock. Okay, over on the right side here. So it's over mm -hmm. here. Right there, that's the, that rock there is about this big, and it's casting a shadow that's like this. Notice the shadows are there. You'll also find spots where the shadows, okay, this is sitting right on the very bottom. Okay, the shadows will seem like they're at a different angle. There's yeah. none in this particular crater. But that only has to do with the swath and when it was stitched together. Okay. So, like, coming over here, we see that the light was just a little bit different from this swath, right? The light was more direct and more directly reflecting back to the LRO. We, so we're actually seeing this, but we're still seeing the trails. We're still seeing these rolling, rolling rocks which come down. Look at that. This is And even if the shadows are off in the same swath, it, it could be the difference between how what the level of the ground is. Well, absolutely, and that's that's you know? that's the next thing to that I was going to talk about when the lunar hoaxers try to say that the shadows are going the wrong direction. Only well, I, I did a a NASA's unexplained files where I actually made a lunar surface with craters and showed dynamically how the the shadows were off when you were looking at it at a low angle, but when you looked at it from the top, they were dead on. Correct. Right. Yeah. Very very cool. But but anyway, this so you look at this and you see all these little hidden details, okay, in this one little crater, right? And then you zoom out and they're lost almost immediately, all right? And then this is what we see. We miss all this, <laughs> okay? And it all comes down to the diffraction limit. And it comes down to yeah, well, that's right, that's right. The diffraction limit is the is a limit imposed actually uh, just naturally on on the ability of a lens and mirror system to uh, you know. Uh, produce high-resolution imagery. Uh, although it's also known uh, in, in part as the Dawes limit. And the Dawes limit is, uh, you know, something the Hubble is, uh, you know, uh, subject to as well. And I'm going to talk about why the Hubble can't see anything on the moon either uh, as well. And I'll tell you why with a, with a visual demonstration. So, but this is an area we went to yesterday with P&K Space Imaging. 
very, really you know, beautiful. But, you know, there's just no hope of getting this close from any telescope on Earth, and not even with the Hubble. Um, so, and we'll, we'll, we're going to talk about that, but look at this. I mean, Well, let me, um, let me give you a question from Ron uh, okay. from ERT Radio. Ron from ERT. Um, Ronald said, uh, no gravity, why does the rock float away? And I guess he was talking about that when you we were showing them when they rolled down into the crater. Yeah, well, the moon does have gravity. The moon doesn't have there an atmosphere, go. but the moon has one-sixth of the Earth's gravity. So it's more of a leisurely roll. Uh, however, objects in motion tend to stay in motion <laughs> on the moon. Um, because of the fact that there's less gravity. So once they start rolling down a hill, there is not a lot of force holding them back to the hill relative to what's on the Earth to cause friction to slow them down and stop them. So lower gravity means the crater here. Uh, we have rocks that have gone way far out into the crater. These rolled down the hill too. But see, they, they rolled and rolled and rolled, but when they got to the bottom, they should have just sort of stopped fairly quickly. But at the lower gravity of the moon, these rocks, which could weigh quite a bit, I mean, these, these, like I said, these guys are about 20 feet across, uh, but you won't have to take my word for it. We'll be able to measure them shortly. All right. Uh, these guys here, when they, when they came to a stop, uh, they could have been rolling down an incline and then onto the floor of the crater. And if the floor of the crater has a gentle uplift, well, then that could explain why uh, we have this, this shape here in the middle where there's almost nothing in the middle. This could be kind of a little dome of... Uh, material that slumped back into the crater during the time it was formed. Uh, but, Charles asked real quick, so the weight is one-sixth, but the mass, inertia, is the same as here? Uh, the mass is the same. That's an intrinsic property. The mass is the same everywhere, but the weight is different. The weight is the mass times the force of gravity, basically the acceleration due to gravity. And that's uh, in, in physics, it's labeled we label mg, mass times the acceleration due to gravity. The acceleration on the moon is one-sixth of that on Earth. On Earth, it's, it's 9.8 uh, meters per second squared is what we call the acceleration due to gravity. It's what holds you down to the Earth, that force. And, Mark, I do want to point this out just so you know. Yeah. Um, the stream, like, shut off and then came back on and was buffering for a lot of people. Um, so I'm guessing it's on your end somewhere because it pretty much happened to everybody. Okay. Um, um, when was that? Was so that about sure. 10 minutes ago? No, it was about uh, 30 seconds ago. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I just want to let you know, just in case, you know, I might pop in on you and say, hey, we went offline again or something. Okay. Because that's you know? the second time it happened. I saw that it went off uh, one time. But <laughs> yeah. It was actually during the time that I was still sharing my screen with you. So it could oh. be a bandwidth issue, but let's see if we can yeah. struggle with it. Well, this this is prime time, uh, usually when people are home using the internet. And if a lot of people are using it in Mark's area, you know, it should it should stabilize at, at the later it gets. Yeah. Hopefully. And I can tell you this. I, uh, I, I did pay some fairly hefty fees to get the uh, upgraded internet that I have. So um, yeah. I'm pleased with that, but we'll just tough it out. We'll make it work. We'll um, make it work. We will make it work. Yes, we will. <laughs> so anyway, looking at these craters now, we're, we've kind of beat these guys to death, although we haven't gone into this crater too much. But that said, we've got a whole moon to explore. Um, now, we know about these two projections now. We know about this one. Let's take a look at these orthographic ones because these are interesting too. Let's start with the South Pole. This is the view of the South Pole. Now, there are some artifacts where all the data comes together, all right? And that sort of makes this kind of squeezed look over here. But if we close in, uh, what happens is it's, it's repaired a little bit and refined. And now you can see that how it looks a little bit nicer here. Now, what's interesting is the South Pole is the area that the L-Cross mission uh, was targeting, and it targeted craters here that never see light in the bottom of the craters. And they did it because they wanted to see if they could find water in ice at the bottom of these craters. And sure enough, they did. All right. However, then they did an exploration of the rest of the moon and discovered that there's water all throughout the moon's soils, uh, subsurface at the surface not so much but under the surface yeah so it's just crazy looking i know right that, that that's distorted a little bit you know because of that yeah but check this out there's something we can do now and i'll come back to this we're gonna be right back to this in a minute if we go to layers here don't be put off by this at this point but there's one thing if you go into layers they're called overlays actually 
Um, if you look, look at these overlays that we have, let's put on nomenclature, just nomenclature, okay? That's all. So we do that, and now we get names of everything we're looking at here. And you'll notice that I have uh, this area right here is prominent, and the reason is because it's Cabius Crater where the L Cross mission uh, you know, targeted and where it actually put that uh, booster, that rocket booster, and it collided with the terrain down here at high speed, and what was splashed up was analyzed spectral, uh, spectral, spectroscopically, and they saw the, that the, uh, it did have signs of water. So that, that's where the L Cross mission targeted. We can't really see into these craters, um, and the reason we can't is because the light doesn't go there for one thing, but second, the exposure that has to be taken to make this look, uh, you know, good, will make this really, really too dark. We'd have to blow this out to bright white to be able to see any reflection into the crater from these uh, these areas here that have light on them. So, um, unfortunately, the data doesn't allow us to do that kind of what's called stretching to actually look deep inside these. Uh, um, Martin Willis live shows asked, uh, are new craters logged mm -hmm. on the moon when an impact happens? <clears throat> Actually, no. Um, we don't have an ongoing uh, uh, seismic presence there. I mean, we had had one with the lunar, uh, sorry, the Apollo uh, seismic uh, 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 experiments that were put on the moon, but we don't have anything now that's actually uh, sending messages saying, hey, a meteor just impacted on the moon. Um, you know, I'm, and, and I could be wrong about that, but I don't, I don't recall anything because I've kind of, I, I, I was following that for, for some time and that could have changed since LRO went up, <clears throat> you know, um, and that was Martin. You said that was Martin. Okay. It was I gotta, Martin. I gotta stop muting myself because <laughs> I can I start answering and I'm realizing the mic's not on. That's okay. Yes, that was Martin Willis live okay, show. Cool. Hi Martin. Thanks for joining us. And. Martin actually uh, texted me. Martin, I hope you don't mind me uh, mentioning this. He texted me earlier uh, today because uh, those of you who don't know Martin, uh, he is Martin Willis. He runs the uh, UFO uh, podcast. Um, and uh, he uh, been on his, his podcast a number of times. Really, really great guy. He actually came down here. We did an on-location one, one time. It was really wonderful. Um, and he lives up in Maine, you know, so that's a heck of a drive. But the... Uh, Apparently, uh, his son and he were uh, talking about uh, the, the moon and had some questions. So uh, I said, hey, come on the stream tonight, uh, and we'll talk about them. We'll, we'll actually uh, you know, discuss the uh, lunar landing sites. And he's like, okay, very good. And he said, oh, it's ironic that I actually contacted you to ask you this question when you're about to do a stream on it. Because uh, I hadn't uh, made that announcement. I actually I was supposed to put it in Facebook, and I didn't do it. I forgot to. Um, but, you know. That's because I had to take my dog to the vet, and she's fine, but, you know, uh, my wallet's not. Anyway, <laughs> so Cabius is the, the location on the South Pole where the L Cross mission successfully detected water. Now, remember, the whole thing was, if we are going to put a moon base, where, where would we put it? Well, we'd put it kind of out here, maybe on Cabius Crater, somewhere down in here, possibly. And then they discovered that there's water in a lot of places on the moon. Don't worry, these are the, these are the nomenclatures that uh, uh, just they go off the map because it's not perfect. The system isn't perfect. Okay, so this is the, uh, again, going back to the maps, this is the orthographic South Pole view, and we saw Cavius Crater where the L-Cross focused. The North Pole is similar, okay? Again, it shows similar artifacts due to the stitching, okay? Things look a little bit, you know, circularized here. That's an artificial, um, you know, artificially generated thing caused by the stitching process. Um, and as soon as you get a little closer, uh, they tend to repair themselves, all right? And you can see here that this, this is actually a good point because this actually shows something very important. We're at uh, 8 meters per pixel here, okay? And you'll see the pixels. These are the pixels. These individual squares are pixels. You'll notice that they're only one color, okay? I want you to remember that for later because that's going to be important when we talk about why the Hubble can't see these, you know, the, the landing sites on the moon. Okay. A couple questions for you real quick if you want. Sure. Uh, of course, Ron again uh, says, what is the temperature variances between sunlight and shadow? <clears throat> uh, it could be 
uh, a couple hundred degrees below zero to a couple hundred degrees above. Uh, but there's no temperature in space. It's temperature of the material that you're standing on or the temperature uh, on the front side of your suit versus the back side of your suit. It has to do with absorption or something, right? Yes, it has to, exactly. I mentioned that yesterday. You remember. See, you're smart. I do. See? Yeah. See, in space. Always tell me when I'm tired. I'll remember stuff. <laughs> you do. I know. I got to give him credit, folks. And the uh, second one was uh, Laura Hove. I think it's Hovey. It if is. it's not, I'm sorry. I'm pronouncing it wrong. She'll tell uh, you. It's Hovey or Hovey. Which, She'll tell you the truth. She'll, she'll pronounce it for you. All right. Uh, which has more water, the North or South Pole? Well, see, that's the thing. Um, we don't rightly know uh, technically, but I do think that uh, what we thought was the, the mystery was that there would probably be water in the permanently shadowed craters. All right. And we've confirmed that that's true. All right. And it's probably true at the North Pole and probably true at the South Pole. Uh, but if you look at the terrain here on the North Pole, okay, this is the North Pole projection. Then look at the South Pole projection. You'll see that there appears to be a more rich variation in craters that are in permanent darkness on the South. So perhaps the South might have a little higher concentration but uh, from the North Pole. But it turns out, too, that we also have water in the soils everywhere on the moon. It's not just down here anymore. So what that does is it alleviates us from having to have a moon base only at one of the poles. That's a huge thing. Because what if we wanted to have a crater, uh, you know, uh, have the crater Clavius have a moon base like in 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? And, and, We'd have Clavius moon How base. How awesome would that be? Would that not be? That'd be so cool. A moon base is one of my favorite craters. Exactly. And I've said this before, but the, the reason why Clavius is such a, a thing to me is because of that almost perfect arc going from biggest to smallest crater. It just it blows my mind that that's a natural phenomenon. Yeah. yeah but it is. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But let's, let's explore that. Let's go to the next projection here just to check it out. This is the Lunar Globe 3D. Check this out. Now this, this here, when we when we zoom out a little bit, okay, well here we see our moon, okay, looks like we expect it to look, but we can also do this. We can go we can go looking at the moon from any way we want now, and we can turn the moon any way we want and see it from any angle now. This is not like how we see it in the telescope, obviously. It's how we want to see it here. And this is really, really interesting. This is the best projection. I'll show you the limit right away, though. When you zoom in, okay, notice our, our scale, okay. Uh, and by the way, this is the first projection I go to when I'm looking to compare something we found on stream, just because I find it the easiest to maneuver and find where we were. Right, okay. But notice now when we go to look for the scale down here, it's not here. Okay, that's because we can't go to that half meter per pixel in this scale, all right? Uh, or, or rather, on this uh, on this particular projection, now we can go in and go in and go in until we can see individual pixels like this. We can go as far in as we want, all right? But we and these again are individual pixels. So notice how this doesn't look like much of anything until we zoom out, and it starts to start looking like something. And then you zoom out some more, and the farther away you get, in other words, the smaller the pixels are overall, the more this looks like something. And, and that's basically uh, what we're dealing with. We're dealing with resolution. More pixels in a smaller area gives you higher resolution. We don't have that here because the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has its own limits. But I think for a 3D uh, view, this is just uh, one of the best. And it's the kind of thing that I think everyone has been waiting for. And now, like as we move the moon here, we're actually turning a sphere now in the background. Okay, we're actually turning a sphere. See? So that's what's really neat about this. All right. And now uh, then there's some other features that also don't work. You know, we can't show the, like, if I go to, like, look for the nomenclature, okay, you'll notice there's grayed out areas here. Uh, we can't do the nomenclature. We can't show, like, the craters here. If I try to click that, okay, we don't see anything happening because we don't have the ability to show the nomenclature on this particular projection. Um, computationally, it's too much for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter servers. Um, 
It may not be in the future. It might be an upgrade at some point. But this is one of those really wonderful things where you could do some cool features, uh, cool uh, diving. For instance, if we hold down the mouse button, look what we can do. We hold down, I'm sorry, the, uh, we hold down the middle mouse button, all right? And now we can actually go diving into the crater, okay? And we can zoom in this way and then just, like, cross the crater uh, and come right down to lunar level. Check this out. Is that not cool? That is just awesome, you know? Very, very cool. And, and then, it just gives you more appreciation for how big those complex crater peaks are. That is absolutely right. Absolutely. Good, good I mean, point. Look at the size of that thing. Good point, Keith. Now let's try something else. Now, on the right side, okay, we have these on the left, but on the right side, check this out. You see this? Fly around selected point. Ooh, what do we do? Let's hit it. Okay. And, well, first of all, I think I have to select the point. There we are. So now uh, we're actually flying around that crater. All right, in a 3D mode, so we can actually see it. This is beautiful. And by the way, we can we can just get rid of uh, all this and just do this in, in full screen mode like this. All right. If you would have told people 30, 40 years ago that they would be able to do this, they would have called you crazy. Yeah, they would have been saying, you know, um, you know, put this guy away. And they may still screw that. If they would have, if they would have said this in like 2000, they would have called you crazy. Yeah, I agree. And so you can use the mouse to manipulate your view so you can look at it from any angle. Notice, is this not the coolest thing, folks? I mean, look at We are freaking doing our own explorations of the moon, and we're doing it using a tool that NASA provides. Now, this, to me, tells me everything that I think um, you need to know uh, about the moon. There's, no, there's nothing on the moon that you would, you know... Look, we can actually get down here, and as you get down closer... The higher resolution imagery starts popping in. And that crater we're just circling is no longer visible. Why? Because it's over the rim. This is the rim of that crater. If we wanted to see it, we'd have to get closer to it and move up closer, see? Uh, and then, of course, there's something else that happens, and that's when we're really close, all right, and we go zooming. We're still circling that crater in the distance. Uh, but if we if we actually go under, we, we actually see the moon from underneath because that's, the, that's just the... Uh, the, uh, the uh, limitations of the program, but it's kind of cool. It's like looking behind the hologram of the moon, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is kind of fun. So anyway, <laughs> and that's, that's this circle, uh, you know, a, a selected point. So you turn it off, okay, and then... And once again, how do you turn that on again? You turn it on by just clicking it, okay, and mm -hmm. the point that's in the middle of your view becomes the object that you're circling, okay, and um, you click with your left mouse. Let me just do it again, just so people see. All right, so here we are. Say we want to circle this crater. Well, pick, yeah, I was going to say, pick another okay. spot there. just to... So we go like this, okay, and we click here. Bink. And now we're circling that spot. So it's circling whatever point you pick. It doesn't necessarily... I mean, it, obviously, it makes sense for you to put the area you want to see in the center. But say if, like, you know, you back out a little bit and you click it like you're going to circle, and all of a sudden you see something, like, off to the upper right yep. that you want to see that's more... It'll automatically take you there. Yeah. Uh, let's find out. So if I do this and I want to click over here, okay, see, right now it's tied up circling that one point that we talked mm -hmm. about, okay? All right. All right. Now we can do this. We can actually do these kinds of things. <clears throat> you know, the, the hold the left mus mouse button down, and you can go down low to the moon. You can actually get to the point where the curvature of the moon itself completes, completely prevents you from seeing what the crater you're looking at, you know? <coughs> so... Then uh, you can also, uh, as I just showed you, uh, zoom in and circle it like this, right? So it's almost like we're inside of it circling. And again, here comes the high-res imagery to replace the low-res because you're at that level now. And now, here's something else to notice. Uh, let's just stop for a second, okay? You see this artifacting over here, this weird kind of stuff? Uh, let's mm -hmm. zoom in on that. I want to show you what's going on here. You're seeing the limit to the data resolution here. It looks like quarries, you know, where they, they cut into the walls. Okay, but the thing is, you're actually looking... <laughs> you're, moon steps. <clears throat> yeah, moon Great. steps. You just started another conspiracy. Right, this is, this, is just, this, is just the, uh, you know, this is just the limitations of the data. Okay? Um, because you can see now that the data is based on these little squares, and this is the smallest unit of resolution. Okay, for which they have altitude data. Okay, altitude data. Now, 
you zoom out to a certain distance and it no longer matters. But when you zoom in really close, you see these steps. And that's, like I said, it's the limitations for the moment-to-moment -moment little squares of altitude data that they have. And that's why it looks like it does here, okay? Charles asks if, the, if there's a way to change the sun uh, angle or anything, to modify uh, well, the sun a, angle. That's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, there are some data products that are buried off in uh, the layers tab that we can look at. Um, but the thing is, we're looking at the highest resolution available that was taken at that particular time. Uh, when the moon had uh, been illuminated to whatever level it was. So they automatically place the best resolution photo down. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, they want to get close. They don't want to have all these dark and light bands, but we right. do see some dark and light bands, don't we? Okay, mm -hmm. and if we zoomed in here, for instance, okay, we're really close now, and you can see how this, you know what this is? This is like looking at a 3D print up close. Actually, that's how I liken this. It reminds me of that scene in Interstellar. <clears throat> The bookcase. Oh, yeah, right. Like, if you look at it from the front on, like all the different colors of the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the pixels, it looks like that, you know. That's right. But check it out. So that that's so keep in mind, this is where we're going with this. Now, you see this object, you say, oh, that's really cool. Uh, we can circle that object, okay? Uh, and if we circle the object, then you know, we can, again, hit this, fly around a selected point, and pick it. Well, say we want that crater. Let's go there. Now we're circling that, Okay. All right, and that's where we're actually uh, circling. Again, the high-resolution data filters in uh, as we go close. Uh, and in this particular case, you'll notice that there's high-res here, high-res here, and not so high-res here. This is a pass yet to be filled in by the LRO um, you know, uh, satellite. So that's why, in some cases, we won't see uh, a data pass. Um, you know, that's, that's visible, okay? But you can see the resolution of the data, okay? If you compare it to, let's just go right to the edge. Check out the difference, okay? Look how much you see here because it's much higher resolution. But look here, you just see pixels, okay? And pixels, again, are solid colors each. They're one solid color a piece. You have to back out a lot to actually have those pixels make something that looks logical, okay? But when you're going down, now you're looking at data that gives you the difference between where we've been and where we are in terms of our technology, okay? This is uh, lower res LRO data, and it will be backfilled eventually with the actual uh, data from the uh, LRO, but it's not there yet. The moon's a big place, even it's, though it's not a very large relatively. But, you know, the LRO has to make a lot of, a lot of passes in order to... Uh, to uh, fill that in. You know what I found interesting? I was listening to, um, uh, I believe it was uh, Buzz Aldrin, talk about his time on the moon. Yeah. And he said the one thing that nobody realizes, the most disorienting thing, was the fact that he could actually see the curvature of the moon oh, yeah. by walking on it. And it really threw off his equilibrium and balance <laughs> because he could see the curve. Wow. Yeah, that's... that's... And, that, and that's in one of his, uh, one of his books. And actually, uh, if you get the audio version of the book... It's yeah. actually him narrating it, yeah. And just to hear him explain that and how here the, the the curvature of the of the moon actually threw him off the most than anything. Even the gravity didn't throw him off as much as actually seeing the curve on the moon. That's kind of that's kind of amazing. Yeah, because you think that wouldn't be the first thing, you know? Yeah. Now, which astronaut was that? I think it was Buzz. Oh, all the Buzz oh, or okay, Neil? Okay. It's one of those two. All right. All right. I think it was Buzz. Because I I had dinner with Alan Bean. Um, he was a uh, Captain Beam was on Apollo 12, um, which we'll talk about. We're going to talk about it. We're going to look at its, its site and show you all the really cool things about Apollo 12, actually. Uh, you know, the, the lunar module was named Intrepid for Apollo 12. And uh, Captain Bean was a really nice guy. And, and he and I, he was an artist. You know, he did this phenomenal artwork. And uh, I had done moon images, too. And I, without knowing, uh, I created an image, I painted an image of Alan Bean on the surface with a, a seismograph uh, experiment. And uh, he had done the same image. And uh, I went to hear him talk at the science center where I worked. And uh, we were talking after, and I said, oh, <laughs> Captain Bean, I've got the same photo. I, I mean, I, the same image. I did a, a painting of you standing there in front of that experiment, too. Oh, let me see it. I showed it to him. And he says, oh, that's so cool, you know. Then he looks at me and he winks and he goes, more color. <laughs> you know, because uh, here on Earth, 
you know, we see the moon as shades of gray. When he was there, he actually saw it in the true color that it was with his eyes. Very, very different. You know, when it's not going through the atmosphere of the earth, we actually lose, we lose the subtlety of color sometimes, yeah. especially with the bright illumination. Like, like this crater right here, we just see this bright illumination. We don't recognize, for instance, that this soil in here might be red and yellow. Yep. And brown. That's another thing in that audio book he was talking about, the actual colors. Yeah, okay, very good. So so yeah, yep. so it, it that then um, this is sort of dovetailing with what you're reading pretty well. Uh and I, I think that's pretty cool. Now, I know that when when uh you know um <clears throat> when it was time to go to dinner, um the director of the science center said, Okay, Mark, you uh, you go back to work and uh, Doctor Bean and I or Captain Bean and I are gonna go off to dinner and, and Bean said, Wait, can he come too? <laughs> and next thing you know, uh, the director is sort of sitting there kind of fuming at the dinner and uh I'm sitting with Alan Bean and we're talking up a storm, uh like an old home week. Um I mean we just we just connected on a a, a level that, you know, is is wonderful and when he talked about the color on the moon, uh, he said, you know, we'd walk up to these rocks that were just pure white and go to other rocks, and they were actually black. And then there were was, there was shades of gray, of course. But then we saw orange soil. We saw other color soil. I mean, it was just amazing, you know, the, the variation in color. It, it's almost like if it had an atmosphere, you could imagine that the terrain might actually look as varied as the earth terrain minus vegetation, you know. He said because... Uh, the radiation hitting the soils for so many billions of years has changed them chemically. Uh, and we saw that, as I mentioned, I think, on your stream last night, Keith, uh, Oumuamua, you know, the interloper that came through here is 10 times longer than it is wide. You know, yeah. it's like 700 by 70 feet. Uh, came whipping through here and, uh, you know, left at over 86,000, I think, kilometers per hour. And when it did so, they had time to just very quickly look at it, and they saw that the, that Oumuamua was literally a a scarlet red almost. And it's like, wow, that's what uh, interstellar radiation from all the many stars striking it for billions of years, that's what that does. You know, that's what that does. We only have one star that's affecting the objects in our solar system. you know. But when you have many different sources of radiation, plus in the interstellar space... You know, who knows what's going on there, whether it's getting bombarded with more cosmic rays than in, in, in the solar system. It's, we don't know. So it was fun to, uh, to explore Oumuamua as well. Now, Oumuamua has more, uh, you know, uh, more similarities to our moon than the Earth has to the moon, in a sense, uh, potentially, because the moon and Oumuamua probably were forged in a similar way from a similar violent birth. Um, and I just think that that's something that uh, is just, uh, I just love the mysteries, right? Astronomy has many mysteries. So um, so let me, uh, let me just back out here now. So this is the Lunar Globe 3D. And I do want to go back to the near side. And I can hear everybody going, oh, you know, but you know, this is not a 3D uh, mode. But we need to go here because I want to show you some of these other things now. So we just talked about projections you know, how this thing is presented to you. Let's talk about the layers now. Who we, you know, this is like, who we, DD. This is something really interesting. You have these overlays that you can click, all right? So we have anthropogenic features. What are those? Well, it tells you. You just hit this little information thing, okay? And this tells you all of the human-made objects that we have on the moon. And this is how it is. And if you turn it on, okay, you see them as little dots and they, they have numbers in them if we zoom in okay all right we zoom in and we get to uh taurus now this is the hadley rill this is the apollo 15 landing site um and it's it labels like the lunar rover for instance okay and we're going to come back to this actually uh in a little while okay but i, I promise but the thing is we we actually can see all these objects uh that were left over from human uh, uh human exploration of the moon it's just spectacular how this product is so complete. And it's being updated, you know, as time goes on, it's being updated. And within these, you can actually search for anything you want to find. Like if you want to search for anything, you can just look it up. Um, you know, if you're looking for the laser ranging experiment, where is that located? Well, you can find it, you know. 
So there's a lot of things that the anthropogenic features will show you. Now, if we zoom out, uh, you actually can see that they're in these, they're in these different colors. Uh, this, uh, I'm looking for, oh, there's a color key for some of these. And uh, again, the product does have a little, some quirks here and there. But if we look down here, okay, this is Surveyor 6. Okay, this is one of the surveyors. What was that? Surveyor 6 was a probe that landed on the moon, made a soft landing on the moon, okay, and it just happens to be in one of those zones where the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter hasn't gone through yet and given us this better data, all right? You'll notice also, see the taper? That's what you were talking about before, Keith. This taper is, again, the thing was in a, it's in a little bit of an elliptical orbit, so, you know, these uh, images here are going to be in the highest resolution, and these images here are going to be in a little bit lower resolution. You follow? <coughs> so, um, and are you still on mute? You're probably on mute. No, I'm mute. I'm oh, okay, okay, good. <laughs> so if we zoom in, we'll see that Surveyor 6 is just out of our view, you know. and Just uh, a bit outside. Just a bit outside. Yeah, so. But, but yep. Yeah. well, let's go to a one that is in high res. Okay, let's do let's that. See what it looks like. All right, and uh, I want to make sure I don't go to a. Uh, uh, I want to make sure I don't go to a uh, landing site yet, because I will. All right, now here is this is really interesting. Now, <laughs> the fourth stage of the Saturn V rockets were uh, discarded over the moon and crashed into the moon. Um, and let me just see now. There's a if you look at the anthropogenic features here, you see opacity. I can actually slide this slider, and you'll try it and you'll do it yourself. And you'll see that you can make that go all the way, go away, or come back. So let's go to about there. This is the wreckage. This crater was created by the crash of that fourth stage into the moon from lunar orbit. Check that out. That's debris in there. If we could have seen, if we could see that at a higher resolution, we would see dust-covered debris uh, along with some shiny metal. Because once uh, the material, once that stuff settled out of the uh, uh, exosphere, the area around the moon. Uh, it would have actually just settled down and there would be nothing to put more dust on it except other impacts somewhere else on the moon where that put dust into the air. So over billions of years, this will be kind of lost as a dusty pile. It'd be buried in the pile over time. Or found by future explorers. <laughs> or utilized. I mean, yeah, they come there and just utilize the metal or something, you know, as a, as scrap. Um, well, that was a plan at one time, or maybe it huh? still is using actual spent rocket bodies as a... As areas to set up uh, a bases. Yeah, that, originally it was, and that now with uh, Robert Bigelow and the inflated tats, it was inflatable habitats. I mean, those are far cheaper to uh, utilize because they can just be packaged away on the rocket to the moon on the outside of the craft. You know, they can just be on the outside of the craft for crying out loud, not inflated, of course, but they could just be ready to go and packaged up and then, uh, you know, taken out of a uh, you know, uh, a holding area and inflate it on the moon from the oxygen in the ship. And then they can continue to utilize the water in the soil to make water and provide oxygen and possibly take hydrogen for use elsewhere. And then they could mine helium-3 from the soils and use it for fusion power at, at some point because the fusion reaction requires helium-3. What is helium-3 anyway? You know, if people don't know, it's, a, it's an isotope of helium. Uh, and what makes an isotope? An isotope is a different flavor of the same atom. So helium uh, is two protons and two electrons, and that's a uh, has a charge of uh, overall charge of nothing, a zero, because the electrons exactly uh, you know negate the two protons, which are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. So uh, if you add a neutron. To an atom. So you add a neutron to helium and you have two protons and a neutron. That gives you helium-3. Okay? And then you have helium-4 with two protons uh, and, and two, neutron, or two, pro, two, two protons and two neutrons. So this is how you make isotopes. Now, Well, just to give people an idea, why, why, is, why do you think helium-3 is so wanted? Or well, why, why do you think a lot of people were talking about it? I know, I know, and you know the answer to this, but some pe other people might not. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's where I'm going, because uh, helium-3 is part of the products of fusion. It's actually part of the fuel for fusion. 
And if we already have helium-3, that takes us, uh, that, that moves us farther away from the need to actually make helium-3. If we have helium-3, we can automatically uh, utilize it to uh, provide a, a fuel source for fusion. You know, it's Which a, also backs up our idea as why we should go to the moon first instead of Mars. That's all right. And in fact, I, I've, I've always agreed with that. Um, and uh, actually, <laughs> I was... Uh, I was uh, watching uh, when the Mars InSight lander landed today. Of course, I was cheering like a little girl. I thought it was wonderful. Um, Amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was beautiful. And I just, I kind of knew it was going to go okay. You know why? Because uh, I just, you know, we were very successful. And we've been the most successful nation to land on Mars, you know, of any nation. Uh, we have the highest success rate over any other nation. Now, obviously, the only other nation would be, you know, China or, you know, the, or Russia. And uh, Russia has tried a few times. Now, there's only been a few totally successful uh, landings on Mars, but we have the highest percentage of them, um, <clears throat> which isn't saying much because there's been a lot of attempts, I guess. But um, when we look at Mars now, for instance, I know this is the moon, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, and yes, I wish we had a uh, orbiter like the, uh, <clears throat> the MRO uh, uh, orbiter, it's the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that imagery is also available online and boy oh boy does that look beautiful and you can go look at mars kind of the same way as here just not in the same uh delivery style you know what i mean are the interfaces kind of set up the same <clears throat> uh no okay. uh, yeah i wish they were uh however you know uh that's an opportunity that's an opportunity uh you know that that may <laughs> i see what you did there that's an opportunity oh yeah that's the spirit ah? Ah, that's wink, the wink. spirit. <laughs> well, we all have curiosity, right? So, uh, okay, now you just went too far. Oh, come on! All right, <laughs> I should go back to Phoenix. <clears throat> Ooh. So yes. Um. So clearly, wow, wow, wow. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, sorta. So yeah. So uh, these features here, the anthropogenic, anthropogenic, are the ones that we made. All right, and. Uh, they're uh, features that uh, you can look up and enjoy. Um, then you have these others. I'm not going to go through every one of these, okay, because it's crazy. Like CX targets, what are those? Well, if you look at it, you would say, oh, the regions of, of interest is identified by the Constellation Program Office. All right, and it talks about the Constellation Program, manned spaceflight program development from 2005 to 2009. In other words, when they were exploring going back to the moon, okay, and exploring what they were going to be looking at, with the LRO, uh, this was a program that they used to specify some of the main features they wanted to go look for. Okay, so that's something that's really interesting. Um, although, like I said, not terribly interesting if you don't want to check out the historical part of this. Now, this is so. How much? Out. How much do I got to tip you to check out uh, to check out Pythagoras? Some point tonight. Not much. No. No. A couple bucks. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> Help me start Only a because Patreon of that giant for a laser. Sky to a live stream. Yeah, we'll look at the giant laser in Pythagoras. Yeah. So now here's the other thing we can do. Uh, we can also put up the latitude longitude grid. Okay. So this is like in case you actually want to, uh, you know, see. You can see the grid now is forming. You can you can see it now. It's dynamic. So if we come down to, you know, uh, let's say uh, let's say we come down to uh, Copernicus here. Let's go to Copernicus. This is Copernicus crater. Okay, we come over here. As we get closer, you'll see that the grid changes a little bit, and it's actually it's changing uh, in, in a way that allows us to not have these gigantic lines blocking our view. So it's very, very nice. Um, uh, Mr. Bronson wants to know real quick. Uh, Mark, Ted Bronson. Do you know if Google will be using LRO data to upgrade their Google Moon data? You know, I'm not sure because that, that might be an ownership issue thing, and I'm not sure, but I can tell you this. Uh, Google Moon is the last, last product on Earth that you should use to actually explore the moon. And I think you guys can see why. Watching what I'm doing tonight, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, I will never use Google Moon again. Because this is far and away vastly superior. And it's free and you paid for it. <laughs> That's right. <coughs> so Sorry. use it. Use it. You yeah. paid for it. Use it. That's right. Yeah. This it is a great thing to have up if, you wa if you're watching Mark. 
if you're watching Bill, if you're watching us over at the Moon Streams, this is a great thing to have up, especially if you have dual screens. Yeah. So you can see where we are and just zoom in yourself to see what it looks like up close and personal. Right. Without all the atmospheric distortion and right. everything. Right. Now, I on the, the other night when you and I were on, I, I wasn't using this, okay? Um, I was actually just sort of sitting there and, you know, talking with you and watching your stream. But, you know, people were saying, wow, you know these craters. How do you know these craters? Well, it wasn't because of this. It's just because I've used this so much. And because I've looked at the moon ever since I was nine, when I got my first telescope, I just became very, very familiar with the darn thing. You know, so it's it's very clear, you know, that there are other people out there that aren't, well, as much without a life as I am, <laughs> in that way. But, you know, I basically, you know, when I look at the moon, I, uh, I I know a lot of the uh, craters and stuff, but I don't necessarily uh, have to um, consult something. And sometimes I do, you know. Uh, now, actually, this this I'm actually kind of jumping ahead a little bit because what I want to do is uh, before well, I, go, I just want to make it clear because what we talked about earlier. So, um, what were we at when when you zoomed in and it was basically what Paul was getting? Was that like thirty some uh, meters per pixel or something like that? Uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. Yeah, I think uh, let's go back to it because I'll, I'll show you right away. Okay, I was like right about here, and I believe yeah. this was uh, 125 meters per pixel. Okay. Yeah. Right. And if we compare, uh, if we compare uh, a stream from last night to this, we'll be able to know. And that's about <laughs> how far away we were last night, give or take. Right. You know, so it's 125 meters per pixel. Now, once again, we were dealing with atmospheric distortion and everything like that, so you know where you know, right. it's near was, as clear as what you see here. It was but, going like this, you know, like everything. Yeah. It had some little wanderings going on, but but to Paul's credit, oh yeah, it was great. And I want to mention one thing to what everybody. One of the things that occurs sometimes is you get these this, these high clouds sometimes, and people say, "Oh no, high clouds." Well, guess what? High clouds can serve to stabilize. Okay, stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. Yeah. Repeat that because your mic your mic built out for about five seconds. Oh, but so just start from the beginning again. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I was saying that uh, if you look at the uh, at the at the moon stream, sometime like in P and K, you'll you'll see that someone says, "Oh, high clouds in the area," or high clouds like fog or or haze or whatever. And sometimes that helps the view. Um, I I I like to tell people that. You know, there's an observatory that looks at just the sun that's in the middle of a lake. It's called Big Bear Observatory, and it's in Big Bear Lake. Uh, and, and so sometimes the water serves to help stabilize the image. And last night, there was a point in time, and because we can't predict it, because we can't control it, uh, you don't have, you know, uh, you don't have the best sighting and viewing all, all the time. But last night, there was a point where there was high clouds. And the view was superb. It was actually better than previously, you know. And I thought that that was wonderful. And that shows how this high fog, or, or sometimes, can actually serve to better the image. Um, and there's there's probably some physics going on in it. I don't, you know, uh, you know, pursue because I think that, uh, you know, there's something to do with the way the image is actually uh, uh, being affected by that. That fog. And there should be an there should be an asterisk next to that saying that it it can help. Yes, yes, that's true. But it also can make it worse, <clears as> well, <throat> depending on what's going on up there. You're absolutely right. Obviously, and that's why I said you can't count on it, and you yeah. can't control it. But there are moments of clarity where you see this amazing view. Now it works for things like the moon. Where it would fail you is when you're looking at faint nebula, you know, like faint uh, star forming regions and stuff like that in the sky. Uh, then any clouds are just not going to work for you. So, but uh, but you know, and, and Keith, you're right, obviously about that. Um, but so that's so about 125 meters per pixel is what we're looking at when we're looking at uh, Paul's uh, you know video that he's producing in 4K, I might add, which is uh, among the highest uh, video resolution you can have now. But uh, so we talked about the latitude and longitude grid. Uh, we also have sunlit region. Now, if you don't know what the moon is uh, you know, set up for, well, here it is. This is what the moon is right now. This is the phase of the moon right now. And we see it with this artificially created sunlit region here. This is just an overlay. It's not showing proper shadows, as I can prove to you as I zoom in. Okay? Because now you see how it's just sort of fading away, fading out. Okay? 
And if you'll notice, the shadow on this side of this crater is on the wrong side, okay? Uh, it, it should actually be on this side, okay? So uh, it's not, not actually, uh, you know, correct. But that said, <clears throat> it just shows you what the moon's phase is right now, and that's just kind of cool. I always leave it off because I don't need that. Now, where's the LRO right now? Well, it's right here. It's, 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 on, it's, it's actually on the other side of the moon. Uh, because we'd see a little red dot where the LRO is sitting at the moment. Um, uh, so that, that's really you know, kind of cool. It just shows a real quick thing. Um, <clears throat> now, if you like 3D... How, how updated is that? Is that like... Um, uh, it's buggy. Like, okay, that, that's, that's the thing. It's buggy. So if Within we, an hour accurate, you think? A couple hours? Um, I think they strive to make it you know, accurate to like right now. But mm -hmm. it's a matter of polling the server. I don't think it's, it's, it's very... Uh, you know, accurate right now because earlier today when I was actually playing with this, I noticed that the satellite was staying in the same position for minutes on end. It's like, well, it's not polling at the right time, obviously. Okay. You know, maybe so it's more like minutes instead of hours. Well, I think each black, each of these green dots is a polling time, and okay. so when it's here, you've got to wait for a little bit of time before it gets to here, and that little bit of time is actually going to be just a probably a few seconds. Um, because it's yeah. Moving. How fast is that thing orbiting? Do you know? Well, it's moving at 30 miles uh, above, so uh, we can actually figure out the orbital speed required, knowing the mass of the moon and stuff. So I don't know offhand, but we can calculate that. Uh, hmm. I'd rather not right now because yeah. that, that would take me kind of <laughs> off topic for a little while. But I don't, you know, it, it's something we could figure out pretty easily yeah, that's cool. uh, if you know what's going on. Uh, but that's, that's the cool. satellite position thing. It's it's kind of cool. It's a neat little uh, neat little uh, utility. And again, you have information uh, bubbles over here to just pick all these things. Now, if you like 3D, then you can look at these, uh, you know, NAC stands for Narrow Angle Camera. And anaglyphs are those red and blue uh, 3D views. So if you come down here, okay, as we come down into one of these, let's see. Uh, if I click on it, you see that some data comes up. And if I click on it again, there's a link here, okay. And if I click on this link, it takes us to a browser window, and we see this 3D uh, view. You see it's red and it's blue. This gives you, uh, if you wear the red and blue glasses, this is something that will tell you, uh, and I'm going to use the plus, and science, plus here to increase the uh, magnification just so you can see it clearer. <clears throat> okay, so here's how you get 3D data like that from the moon. Um, anaglyph is sort of old. Um, I prefer not to use the anaglyph method, frankly, because I don't, li I don't like it. Because you know, I'm, I'm used to you know, working with Doug Trumbull, and we do 3D without these kinds of glasses. We do 3D uh, using just regular glasses that are just very, very light gray tinted, and they uh, they 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 alternate between shutting off the right eye and shutting off the left eye, and they let the other eye open up. You know, they they open the shutter of the other eye opposing the 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 one that's off for the moment, and it just blinks back and forth, tick -tick 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 -tick, very really fast, and you only see the frames to your left and right eye that are, are needed to, for you to build this 3D image. So uh, it's really kind of a, a cool process, more advanced. You don't have it at home. It's not the kind of thing you can just turn on at home. So, but you do have these glasses. You can just look at the glasses and, and, and use the glasses and, and get a, a semblance of 3D. Now, because the moon, to most people, is one color, uh, this is okay. But with regular 3D, um, uh, like, uh, like uh, we use at the studio, for instance, this technique simply wouldn't work because it wouldn't be able to show you color. Okay, well, that said, uh, we come back to this, and now, um, so if you have, if there's an object in here that, that's marked, you can click on it, and many times you'll be able to go and get this anaglyph, this 3D view. So with the red and blue glasses, you could just put them on, look at the screen, and off you go. It's really cool. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, as far as uh, the next thing, LROC featured images. All right, we're going to come to that in just a minute, but let's do nomenclature one more time. I'll tell you why. Because now, if we want to actually see what we're looking at, okay, we know that this is Copernicus Crater, okay? But if I click on it, it tells us a lot of detail about Copernicus Crater. Check it out. It tells us what kind of, you know, uh, who found it and what it was named for. It also shows the diameter, okay? And these numbers are in kilometers, by the way. Um, and uh, so it shows all these things. Very, very cool. 
And then there's a link. And you say, oh, what's that link? And that link brings you to another map of the moon. And it shows you some details about Copernicus and allows you to dig through and see all these. Uh, these are called satellite craters of Copernicus. And they're called satellite craters because you think, well, maybe they were made at the same time as Copernicus. But that's not true. Uh, they just happen to be associated with Copernicus and probably not uh, are actually created by Copernicus or from Copernicus. All right, that, That's because sometimes they're inside the same crater. Um, that said, uh, this site we're at is at the International Astronomical Union, and it gives all the information. It talks about the moon, Mars, asteroids, other things. So we're on the moon right now, and it's a gazetteer. It's a, you know, a gazette, basically, of, of uh, Copernicus. So you see, there's a lot of ancillary, that is, additional information that uh, is made available to us when we go to this browser, and that's what makes it so special, okay? Now, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, now, it's me looking at the nomenclature. Let me just see if we got some. There we go. Okay. All right. So under the nomenclature now, um, you'll see that there are different colors for different things. Craters are purple. Albedo feature. What's albedo? Albedo is reflection, reflectivity. All right. How bright is it? Okay. Albedo features are in yellow. All right. They're listed as yellow. And landing sites will be orange. So when we look around on the moon here, okay, we say, oh, look at that, you know. Now, oddly, when, when you go into uh, an object like Aristarchus, you would expect there to be an albedo feature, wouldn't you? But we don't see an albedo feature. So you have to be careful about what is meant by an albedo feature. Um, this is bright. And, uh, I mean, look at Aristarchus. It's gorgeous, right? Now, in P and K space imaging, I think we've seen Aristarchus uh, at uh, like about here. We get closer than that, Keith. Uh, on really clear nights, we can get a little bit closer. Okay, so somewhere between that last one and here, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is That's sixty-four right. meters per pixel. All right. Not bad. Not bad at all. Okay. And then you can see Herodotus over here. Now, if I was to tell or ask anyone out there. Which crater occurred first, Herodotus or Aristarchus? What would you answer from just looking at this image right here? You can tell the answer. Do you want me to say? <laughs> no. Well, I'm just let people think about it, okay? Okay. What occurred first, uh, Herodotus or Aristarchus? Which crater impacted first and why? See, this is, a, this is typically a, uh, this is like a, a little quiz question that I've actually given to people in classes that I've run. But, uh, it's like a chicken or egg answer. I, yeah, kind of, no. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. But anyway, I'll give you the answer in a few minutes. But the, the point is, this area on the moon, again, covered by amazing wealth of detail. And as we zoom closer, you see the, the high-res imagery gets substituted in. Okay, And uh, we go down, and you'll see it, you get closer and closer, and then, then there's like this little last bit of like sharpness that shows up and that's what happens this is as close as you can get here this is half meter per pixel this is actually just a shadow on going up this edge all right now i guess the question is okay what do you do is now that you can look and see all these things in the moon what can you do with them well tell you what let's go play around a little bit with that all right now there are some features here on the side we haven't talked about but while we're here Okay, we know about nomenclature. That gives us all the names and the locations of various things that happen. And I promise you we will be looking at the landing sites. That's up in featured images, and we're going to do that shortly. But I want to show you one thing really quick because it does depend on nomenclature. Say you're doing a project on Aristarchus or you're thinking about Aristarchus and you want to look it up. If you come into this tool, this little guy right here, the query tool, you hit the button, and now you just see, okay, a uh, a line or a polygon? Hmm. Well, okay, an arc, actually, because if you're drawing a line on the moon, it's going to be like an arc. So here's how this works. We've selected it, and now what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line from here all the way through Herodotus and then all the way through Aristarchus to here, and then I'll double-click. And you'll notice, by the way, this is an arc. You can see it's curved. And this is the, if you look on the left side for now, 
okay, you can see that where I have the mouse, it's following a specific set of contours. And on the right, it's showing you where those contours are on the actual image, okay? Now, not only that, we're also able to see what the momentary depth is and height, all right? Now, these, what, what's the height measured against? Well, it's measured against the mean radius of the moon, okay? And right now, this point right here, okay, right there, that's the Aristarchus Plateau that we're on right there, okay? That height right there is at a, a value of 347 meters above the mean radius of the moon. Then we go into the crater, and the crater dug down 3,187 uh, roughly, because I'm not going right to the center, 3,187 meters below the mean radius of the moon. I mean, that's a huge difference, okay? And now, um, this is a way to actually uh, do a really, really cool study. And if, say, you want to download this, you can actually hit download CSV. That means comma-separated values. And you could download those as actual numbers for the entire line you have over here, okay? This is cool. Now, Say you want to do it again. You say, well, wait a minute. I just want another one, and I want to just go across the other way. So you can start out here, make a line, and then you draw the line. You click once, draw the line, then you double-click to end it. All right? Now we're going right through the center of Aristarchus, and now look what you see. Now we have this second one over on the left. It goes up at the edge, and if you look on the, on the, on the main view, you can actually see that we're climbing up just on top of the edge and now going down the slope of Aristarchus. Okay, sorry, going down the slope of Aristarchus into the crater. And we see there's a tiny little bump in the middle. So we actually just sort of intersected a little bit of the central peak there. Then we come up the other side. Okay, and it's actually pretty uh, pretty steep there. You know, and it's, it's a terraced walls. And Aristarchus is neat because what it points out is it, there have been, uh, when, when this crater was made, the material that was blasted out basically went this way. All right, it didn't go this way. Okay, we see some ray structure, notice. Okay, but it didn't go, much of it went this way. So, you know what they want to know what the people said the answer was? Oh, yeah, I do actually. I'm not, I was going to wait, but uh, uh, most people said uh, that Aristarchus was the second, except for me and Ted. We both said the Aristarchus, or, or the Aristarchus was the, yeah, the second impact, me and Ted said, right? Yes. Yes. And I know most other people said that the, the other one was the first impact. Okay. Well, that's very good. Or the second impact, I should say. Yeah. And and this is and I know that seems like a maybe a, a simple kind of exercise for a lot of you, but think about this. Can I tell you the reason why I think that? Yes, please do. That Aristarchus was the second impact? Tell me. Because the ejecta pattern from Aristarchus is actually laying on top of the other one. That's exactly right. And you're exactly yeah. right about that. And then, and what you hit upon, see, that's important because when we study the moon, we study the chronology. The order of impacts is very, very important. You know, like, uh, let me turn off uh, nomenclature here for just a second because uh, it, it does get in the way, as you'll find. Uh, let's just go over, and those lines will stay there because I left them there. But if we come over here now and we look, <clears> that <throat> this is a Maria, okay? This is a Maria that was caused by a massive impact right here. See that? This was a massive impact, okay? All right. In fact, we can pick this little guy, too. This was a massive impact, too. Not as much as the other one. Uh, but this uh, impact and this little impact, all these little impacts in here, you know, you can see the chronology. These had to come later because they're sitting in existing cooled lava that's on the surface, right? So clearly... Uh, the order of impact is very important. Now, it could be that, oops, sorry, it could be that most of the moon in this area would have looked like this, with highlands that are, are kind of rough like this. But as the lava was uh, flooded out from these impacts, it buried a lot of those things and buried a lot of the features, and only the highest ones survived. See, it's almost like if, you, if it looked like water, if you consider this water, these would be shorelines where the the land rose above the water, so to speak. And perhaps that's why these were originally called seas and maria, because it reminded people of the same type of shorelines that we see here on the earth. Naturally, it couldn't be anything further from the truth. <laughs> but man, is that not cool? So when we look at this, I can tell you that when we look at the chronology of impact events here, 
we can see that obviously these smaller craters came after this impact, okay? And um, this impact right here, all right, came after this impact. How do we know that? Because this would otherwise be complete. This, this entire side of the impact is gone. Why? Because when this impact occurred to cause it, uh, it buried that. It got rid of it. So you learned about the chronology, and that means that we, we, when we say chronology, we really mean age. Okay? So the Maria, all right, that have these little craters in them like this, okay, those craters are more recent than the underlying material. All right? And that's something that's very important that we like to look at on the moon and you know, this all relates to you know my specialty, which is exoplanets, of course, because when we get to the point where we can start to see uh, you know, reflectivity on moons uh, of exoplanets or on exoplanets themselves, uh, we're going to be able to use some of these theories and some of this uh, theoretical information to kind of uh, help us decide or figure out how these things occurred, how they came about. Amazing, man, I tell you. Uh, i got to show you something else right here. It's like I'm on the moon. It's like, I can't stop. Um, but if you take a look, here is a very interesting feature. On this part of the moon, okay, let's just back out for a sec. This is just a, a little area, and it's a, there's a crater here that occurred uh, after this thing. Okay, it's aliens. Yeah, it's and not just aliens. Yeah, so <laughs> if you look at this, you'll notice it looks like uh, it's sort of scalloped. It's segmented, right? That, that yeah. segmenting there. What is that? Those are collapsed they're, they're collapse pits, and they're collapses of a lava tube or a, a volcanic origin, a, a volcanically uh, a created um, feature here. Or as some people call them that uh, don't have the resolution, they call them moon bases. Yes. And actually, that's a good point. If you want to see a moon base, okay, this could look like a dome to you, right? But if you want to see it as it really is, just if it looks like a dome, Turn it upside down. Yep. All right. When you turn things upside down, your brain is no longer fooled, and your brain sees both the views, and it can it make them it can make them look correct. You're you're sitting on this, and I'm I'm for some reason like right when you said that everything turned into domes. Right. Now I'm trying to get my eyes to readjust again because I was concentrating on that intersection where everything comes together, right where your your mouse is right now. Yeah. Okay. And all of a sudden I look back up where we were looking at yeah. and everything turned into domes. Right. Now everything's domes now. Right. This so looks I like readjust. Yes, this looks so what you do is right here. So if, for those of you that have domes in your head when you're looking at this, <laughs> do this. Just turn your head as close to upside down as you can, and it will return to normal for you. Um and you'll and see it's it. back. <laughs> and it's back. <laughs> see? No, the thing that worked for me, like I tried to turn my head both sides, but I just went further down to the right. Yeah. Like down and to the right, down and followed that trail. Yeah. And something in that and that trail down there actually gave it off and it probably, everything corrected itself. Probably again. these craters here, because no, it was something in that line. I'm not sure what it was. But oh, okay. Maybe it was where those craters were cross-secting that that maybe right, right that there. collapse area. Yeah, there. I think kicked it back to where it was supposed to be. Yeah. But see, that's the thing, and the nice thing with the LRO Quick Map browser is you can actually just zoom in. Can you draw on the moon? Can you draw on the moon? Yeah, is there like a thing, like a tool to like make like your own marks or anything? Uh, well, the only, the only, you can put what are called probes, okay? Uh, oh, okay. But so you couldn't make a smiley face to make that look like Mickey. Oh no, I wish you could. That Somebody be... said that in the chat. Yeah, that would be that. fun. Amal, <laughs> I see Amal, Mickey. Amal asked some good questions. I gotta give give him credit. Thank you. Um, yeah. That's kind of fun. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> But you see, you, you can see how this is like the, the edge. Now, if you're really concerned about what that looks like or whether that really is a dome, then, well, we can answer that question very quickly because we can just go back. I'm going to get rid of these uh, previous ones. There's a little trash can there. You just hit that, and they go away, the previous marks. Let's do this. Let's grab and make a line right through this dome, so to speak. And now you can see there's not a dome. Hey, I'm just saying it, it, no, it corrected no, no, but, itself but I'm, now. I, I know, but I'm telling you <laughs> how people can correct that. Okay, yeah. this gets you past that illusion. See this? If that looks like it's going up, it's clearly not. It's going down. See? <laughs> yeah. And then it climbs again and it comes out. So now this is how you can actually tell. And again, how do we do that? Well, we were actually just going to this query tool and like that. And we used the line feature here and we drew a line through the object of interest. Now, now, can we can we measure that uh the big crater area there? 
to see how big it is. Across. Absolutely. Which way do you, you mean this object right here? Yeah, this thing? just okay, a center then, portion. Sure. Yeah. Let's see how you do that. Watch. And First then we all, can measure like how long that uh, that collapse oh, is. Oh yes, all you the way. can. So let's let's measure. Okay, this was an impact crater that you saw here. Okay, that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So let's measure that. So we're gonna go to this, and uh -huh. we're gonna say, all right, I've got that selected. So I'm gonna click on there, and I'm gonna drag it down here and click off of it. And uh, sorry, double click on it. <clears throat> And there we go. There's what, our... what is it? Google Moon allows you to um, actually uh, set like different parameters, like feet or meters, or yes, that's I think in the Google measurement. Moon is the one that does that. Does this do tool. that as well? Uh, now this one here, it's basically it's sticking to the astronomical standards. It's, it's meters okay. and kilometers. Okay. So here you can see the distance is eight thousand five hundred seventy-four point eight two meters. Now for those that um, you know, don't know meters or whatever, that's eight point five kilometers because it's a it's thousand a big meters Mickey. per and you know what if you turn your head it does really look like Mickey like you, the whole thing the body the legs and it looks like got black pants on oh hey Pluto I <laughs> know right uh -huh. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it does it really does yeah you know you're just Good looking catch. for an opportunity to do your Mickey impression I know no, it really <laughs> does turn your head sideways that little bulb at the bottom yeah where your line starts at the bottom yeah. it's his nose I know it sure does look it yeah, no doubt. Oh, that's funny. You're looking at the LRO, sponsored by Disney. Walt Disney. <laughs> yes. So yeah, that's cool. So oh. there you go. And now, of course, if we wanted to do actually, we could zoom in on this this 8.5 kilometer size uh, depression, this crater. Uh, again, down at the bottom here, 0. 0.5 meters per pixel. And you know, in what projection? Well, this is on the uh, orthographic near side projection that we're on and then we can utilize that uh, tool to measure anything we want in there i will show you the limitations though okay let's say we want to measure this crater okay and by the way notice there's another boulder track right there see it yeah there's the boulder oh a curved boulder track too yeah because it, it, it's like you know the the green breaks a little you see <laughs> uh, yeah. and it came down yeah i think that's pretty neat and you can actually see where it originated from. It came from right around here, probably ejecta from you know uh, another impact or whatever. But you know this was uh, dislodged, you know, by uh, another uh, meteor that struck somewhere else, maybe down here somewhere, or whatever. But the vibration was enough to dislodge it and move it, because every time a meteor hits of substantial size on the moon, uh, boulders that are sort of on that precarious, nearly ready to fall. Uh, position are just going to go rolling downhill and it's probably a lot more harsh because of the fact that there is once again we talked about this with the moon ring like a bell but because it doesn't have a liquid core the vibration is probably pretty well it probably was very substantial yeah you and know when a bigger one hit even if it was way far away from the impact so. it, exactly right because uh <laughs> in fact the impact could be very very devastating for the opposite side you know right um and that's the thing, like with a croquet ball. You know, if you put your foot on a, a croquet ball and then you uh, and then you you hit the left side of it, and you have another croquet ball on the right, the ball on the right goes sailing away at high speed. That's because all of the energy was focused, and that's right, was, all the energy was focused through the first ball, and and then it went off and knocked the other ball out of the way. Well, if it's just the moon, if you have an impact hit one side of the moon, um, all the energy is going to get focused at the far side crust where this where this hits and so you can actually get disruption of objects on the far side that are very very disastrous too not nearly as, yeah. as much as the gigantic hole that was uh, plowed into the moon you know by the a giant object but boy it can it, it can be bad just really just make rocks hop that's right know, on the other side that's right actually it would yeah that, that's true uh and and see these could have been actually, uh, you know, stationary, and then if something hit, you know, elsewhere, it could have made the rocks bounce a little and then start rolling, you mm. know. So I was going to say, though, so if we have this little guy right here, okay, this is the limits of our, our, our you know, we're at 0.5 meters per pixel, very, very close. Let's do this. Let's make a line here, okay, let's grab one of these, and let's make a line, okay, and across here. And now you're, you're expecting to see the, the, the well of this crater pit, right? So let's double-click and see what we get. Okay, 
Okay, well here we see that, you know, we have the uh, the actual crater pit. We can see that, okay, it starts up here, and at this point it's actually, um, uh, where are we here? Um, I'm trying to find the, uh, mm. I am, I'm trying to find, like, I'm expecting to see the, it shows Val, but see the Val is, is like, down below. So, we're actually uh, right, right here where it's minus uh, where that the highest part of this crater is minus a thousand fifty seven um, meters below the mean radius of the moon, and then it just gets cut deeper into the moon. Now, if we zoom in uh, to the point uh, where we're even closer, now if I take this out and I draw another thing, okay, let's say you want to say, hey, how how let's take a look at the uh, the shape of the moon's surface right here, and we go, let's say we just do this, and then we do that, okay? Well, yeah, I get it. I'm going to tell you something, okay? This is new, okay? This is what happened before. The data has been updated since uh, I last was playing with this earlier. I'll tell you why. When I did this before, we couldn't see this because it was within the resolution of the data, and so this was just a straight line over here. So we've already seen an improvement, um, and the server has probably been improved uh, to the point where this data, at least for this swath of the moon, uh, has actually been improved. So this is great. Oh, hey, run that, run that line across that uh, where that boulder rolled through. Oh, just to find out how long that is. Yeah, just see how deep that that little uh, in that oh, little okay, let's impact find. Okay, is. You want to see that? Okay, well, you this would be this against this wall. You're saying. Okay. Well, right next door, you were just zoomed into that. This, this wall right here. You want to see how deep this goes from like the top here? I just wanted you to run like a little line across it, like right next to where you were just were. I mean across it. What do you mean across it? Like zoom left, back into where you right? just were. Yeah, zoom back in where you just were. Okay, see? And I'll just make a, 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 a line, line right going there? across that. Yep. Okay. I just want to see what uh Oh wow. Yeah, that's 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 uh you can see where that is, that's sort of an artifact, okay? Uh, but now, if you notice, you yeah. can't. You know, you I'm paying can't, into everything after that. Up, this is uphill. this is where, this is where it should be, okay, right here. Right. And it does show a little depression, which is kind of interesting. Okay, now uh, if we look here, this is minus. Uh, where are we? At? at the deepest spot, it's minus oh, one thousand no. ninety-five. I'm in domes again. Hold on. Okay, we're back. <laughs> he turned upside down. <laughs> and then uh okay but you see that you see that see how the the cursor moves in little fits and starts it doesn't just go smoothly yeah that's the limit of the data that we're looking at that's what i'm trying to tell you you don't just yeah. get this so it's really better large... over larger areas yes it, it actually is meant for uh looking at larger areas trying to okay. like for instance a, a good use of it is to do something like this where we go from where this rock actually seemed to originate from which is here okay uh, and I'm going to show you another thing too. So we we, we start drawing a line, an arc or a line, and we say we go from say here, and now we get down here and we say, oh no, um, I've got to go further. If you just hold the mouse button, the left mouse, and you drag, you can continue to go. Okay. Now what you can't do is draw a curved path. That's another issue that uh, hopefully they can resolve. So for now we just have to draw these straight lines. But it shows you the slope, okay? It started up here at, um, um, where are we, minus 935 uh, meters below uh, mean uh, moon radius, and then it ends at the bottom of the slope, which is minus uh, uh, 1176 meters. So it fell a fairly good distance, okay? Um, you know, again, we're in meters, remember, so... Um, you know, and it actually the distance it fell was 580. You can see right here, 500. So it would it would go upwards too. 581. Right? If it was meters. higher, what would go upwards? Well, once again, I'm back into the laser gun, and I'm thinking if you started at the base of of um, uh, Pythagoras, yes, and you ran it across over the peak, and then back, you know, just stay in the base, not actually going up the crater walls, you would see a massive upheaval where that laser. <laughs> <laughs> Where well, its uh, central peak is. Well, since you're talking about that, uh, let me just make sure that I've covered things that I want to here. Um, again, for the these overlays, guys, I just tell you this: these are uh, different uh, instrumentation. 
different oh. servers uh, that have different data. Clementine, uh, you know, my friend Chuck actually had, was on the team to create the camera for Clementine. And if you were to bring in the Clementine data, if you were to click on this data, uh, then what happens is you actually see uh, the Clementine data, oh, wow. okay, overlaid over the over the moon, uh, except for areas that are you know have no uh, data available, okay. So you know this is iron oxide. It almost looks like a negative. Well, yeah, this is the iron oxide abundance in, in this particular oh, okay. case. That's FeO, see, and uh, and that's uh, the uh, in abundance by uh, percentage of weight, I guess, in some uh, standard sample, but. Uh, Again, you can you can actually do real science with this if you really do want to do that. Um, but again, uh, the most fun is just poking through this stuff and enjoying it. Uh, you know, and like for instance, uh, let's see, is it the diviner that I wanted to show you? I think yeah, this is it. Uh, this let's, this is nighttime soil temperatures. Okay, and let's take a look at the nighttime soil temperatures. All right. and and this now, just goes to show you that people say, oh, we don't pay attention to the moon anymore. Look at all the stuff going into this LRO. Oh, yeah. yeah. And making it publicly available. Yeah, absolutely. Check this out. Okay, this is telling us the uh, the nighttime soil temperatures. Uh, Train tracks. Moon base confirmed. Oh. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, that's, that's very true. That, that's actually what that means exactly. <clears throat> Ooh. Yes, folks. Uh, that's the one part of the stream that will be uh, remembered. You know, look, it's all green. It's vegetation. Yeah, give it to uh, Bruce. So, like a moon flare. Flare. That's pretty good, Jello. Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much. Pretty cool, except uh, uh, in in a sense. And and you know, they have a scale here, and you can look up what the fraction means and all that stuff. Um, but you see, the different soils have a different uh, uh, capacity to with you know to withhold heat uh, and act as insulating material. Uh, and you can make this, uh, you can change the opacity, uh, but although it's, uh, I should have done it in the correct one here. Uh, I'm not in the, is that the correct one? What am I doing? Oh, Rock Abundance, I think, is the one that. Wouldn't it be weird if Vicky's head was, like, all red? <laughs> like, almost like there was a brain in that crater? Ooh, that'd be, be that'd weird. Be, that would be bad, yeah. Oh, wow. Look yeah, this is, yeah, this is a, a Rock Abundance uh, scan, which actually... This is what we like to call the blueprint. Uh, ooh, very nice. Yeah. This is the rock abundance. Uh, it, rock abundance. It's a uh, fine grain soil based on the day to night temperature. So it's related to, you know, the temperatures are helping uh, point out. Uh, and you'll notice, again, that the poles are done separately. That's why there's a divider there. Interesting that this is here. I don't know the difference between why this is different. But, see, what's interesting about this is that, again, we're looking at the... the uh, the near side, right? And this is our moon showing us that some things are extremely different than what we uh, are used to seeing. This this shows different uh, uh, soil and rock abundances. Whoa. And I don't know why. You know, I'd have to look that up. Can look we it say up. it's lunar warming? <laughs> uh, look what look what crater it is. Okay. Though. It's Tycho. See? Wow. That's Tycho. And this is Tycho Crater. You say, well, how big is Tycho Crater? Oh, I know how to find it. We go to this little Huge. crater tool. Go to that and say, let's draw a picture across Tycho. Let's draw a line across Tycho. And Tycho's twin on the back? Yeah. Checks. And there we go. Right? And there you go. And you can see now. There you go. There's the peak. And it tells you how far uh, across it is. Okay? And it also... But look at that. That peak is almost as high as your starting point on the left. Yes. That's correct, and that's, that's what's interesting. Crazy. That's that that's a function, uh, perhaps, of the impact speed, or the soil composition at that point, because that means that the you know the the liquefaction and the other processes which make this uh, central peak were actually uh, very very uh, uh, conducive to creating this bigger peak here. You know, now uh, I want you to also look here in Tycho's. Oh, wow. Yeah, I want you to look at Tycho's peak here. There's something to look at here. I'm going to get rid of this guy for now. Check out this area right here. Look at these features. Now, Guys, look at how far we are zoomed in. Yeah, we're, we're at... This is just one little spot of the peak. Yeah. One little area. That's right. We're a half meter per pixel. I'm taking it. You're enjoying this, Keith. Yes. Yes, right? Yes, I am. This is a beautiful, beautiful... The moon tool. is my is my Graceland. <laughs> yeah. But here, I want you to see this. Check these, Pete. These, these, these uh, cracks. 
Not to mention that giant boulder on the left. Oh, that guy? <laughs> well, how giant is it? Let's find out, shall we? Huge. Let's go to the query tool and let's drag this and let's see. And if you'll notice, when we do this, we can actually we can actually get a size, although we won't get a profile maybe that looks right. But we can get a size. See, that's straight. Uh, but the distance, look, it's 111.2 meters long. Mm. Isn't that crazy? And that's and it's crazy to think about, but we can't see that. That's right. And by the way, now, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's the short. Are side. we looking at a rock? Are we like measuring the side of a rock? Or are we measuring inside of a crater? Oh boy, here we My go. My eyes just went back <laughs> upon no, no, me. No, no, no. No, this is where, uh, no, no. Okay, no. The shadows are. Yeah. The sh okay. Yeah. Okay, it's definitely so a shadow because the sun's coming from the left. Okay. Yeah. Follow. Gotcha. See the shadow. Yep. See the shadow. But it did look like a crater there. For I know. Seconds. See, without reference points, this, your, your eye can go nuts. Now we can Indeed. actually see. There's, there's this. This soil around here is somewhat reflective, and we actually can kind of see the backside here of that that boulder. The boulder doesn't come out to here. It goes right to here. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's because this stuff is reflecting some backlight onto this. So let's measure that. Let's uh, get rid of this guy. It's 111 by what? Uh, it's by, and we so think... So you got like uh, 35 foot by... What do you mean 35 foot? 111 that, meters. Yeah, 111 meters. Isn't that around 35 foot? Uh, no. Oh. Not bad. Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. I don't blame you. You're tired. You got to get up at 5 in the morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice three hours of sleep last yeah. night. So here we go. So now, I'm good. So now look at this, okay? Uh, we have uh, a distance uh, of, uh, where are we here? Is this this guy, right? Okay, this one, uh, the distance here is uh, 111.08, and this one is 111.21. Um, uh, so this was roughly, uh, it's just slightly longer than it is wide, but not by much. Okay, or slightly, it, it, this, this width here is a little bigger than this guy. So uh, it's sort of an illusion based on the elongation, see? Uh, but I think that's cool. <clears throat> but these fractures here these things are the result of settling and other impacts causing uh, what amount to be uh, you know terrain that may collapse someday <clears throat> these are fractures caused by those terrain uh, fracturing <clears throat> now how 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 steep is that remember this is the, what we're looking at now so we go in here again let's just pull out enough just to get our bearings <laughs> I think me and Jello both messed up <laughs> why <laughs> It's weird we both had the same thing, but meant to say something else. Oh, about about what? I'm, but I'm not. Yeah. See, I can't see the chat. I'm, I should be. I'm cheating off a cheating off a Jello. Oh, okay. What did he yeah. say? Thirty-five feet. I said thirty-five, and he said thirty-four. But we both had three hundred. So yeah, you're off by several hundred, actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but we were close. I mean, if we would have just added our zeros like we were supposed to. <laughs> you well, know? know what you do if you just if you memorize. Okay, not memorize, but if you think about. Uh, what does a 300-plus-foot boulder look like here on Earth? Okay. What's a 300-foot boulder look like? It's it's not small, you know. We're looking no, it's at, huge. No, it, it's not. It, it's it's something that's pretty big. Uh, so I think that uh, what we're looking at here is something that's very uh, <clears throat> interesting. Now, again, the moon can support larger objects, all right? Take a look at the, the shadows here. These shadows are long and steep, right? They're very, very, very long shadows. Yet the shadow of this is not. That's because this is undulating terrain, okay? This is going up and then down, okay? And you know it's going up because it's very, very bright here. So the sun is coming right toward us, and then it's kind of tapering away. <clears throat> well, these long shadows are because they're on the downside, and the sun's at a somewhat low angle to this. And that's why it's getting this angle here. Um, and, you know, I can say this without a doubt. Um, our 3D print of Tycho doesn't show you this kind of detail, okay? But uh, it does show you how the sun works at Tycho. Uh, and that's really a neat thing, too. Um, now, the stitching here, if you look at the inside of Tycho here, there's some really interesting geology going on in here. But look, this is, this is just a fun... A tool to zip around and look inside these craters with. Um, 
and also to do larger measurements. Like suppose somebody said to you, well, how big is this entire basin over here? Okay, this, this whole basin. Well, you can go here and you can do the query tool and you can go over here and say, hey, look, watch. It's, it's, uh, it's this big, watch. Uh, okay. All right, here it is. <clears throat> Notice that you're not looking at a straight line. You're looking at a curve. And that curve is based on the fact that we're looking at a curved surface. So uh, that's why when you look on this uh, over here in the upper left, it says, okay, arc. All right. And if you yeah. want to know how much, uh, for instance, surface area is taken up by a crater, well, then you can actually uh, come over here and do this. Okay. It's just a 3 million feet. <clears throat> well, this gives you like the, uh, this basically the square footage of a crater. You could kind of come around here. All right. And if you draw your lines, click, 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 and then, you know, close it at the end. Okay. All right. Now it tells you that the, the, uh, the distance here, all right, if that's polygon one right here, the area is, look at how many square meters that is, okay? Uh, it doesn't put it into exponential uh, format for you, so, you know, you have to kind of stare at the numbers to figure it out. I, I, I can't get close enough to the screen to see, <coughs> like, because where I am. Um, but the point is, uh, there's a lot of, uh, that, that shows you the square meters for this area. All, all good stuff in case you're trying to figure out, for instance, how big... This is like 754,000 square feet. Well, let me tell you, okay? It's, it's, it's telling you how much you have uh, 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 energy of an impactor, also size of impactor. There's a lot of, that goes into it, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, for people that think that the craters are all the same depth, uh, okay, we have that too. If you take a look at this, all right, this crater... He's just a little guy. He's just a little guy, and he's actually... To uh, us. He's probably monstrous. Well, let's find out, shall we? This is, again, where we come in. We can just say, let's just measure the size. How big is this crater? I don't like this crater because it doesn't have freaking lasers. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it's actually 12,243 meters in size. That's not wow. small. That's not small. You know? All right. And then... Okay, then we have this. So, this is Archimedes, isn't it? I think this is Archimedes. You can, but, but, but if I don't know, we can just say, hey, why don't we go look at nomenclature and what do we got here? There you well, go. Oh, look at that. It, that. It's Archimedes. Archimedes. What, what a surprise. What a surprise. You know, <clears throat> and we can figure out now the size of Archimedes as well. We can do the same thing, go to the query tools, grab that, and say, well, how big is that? Rim to rim, just like the inside, just the inside of Archimedes. How big is that? You click once, and then you double-click, and now we actually see, okay, that we're looking at uh, a, uh, what does it say now? It's a 76,873.83 meters, right? Uh, yep. That's pretty good. Good size. Yep. And that's, that's very cool. Now, uh, the one thing I got to confirm is... Whether okay, because when I look at this and I look at this guy, okay, um, I think this is the distance along the path. So, if you want to actually find out the actual diameter of the crater, I think we got to do something a little differently. But um, either way, uh, I'm okay with that. I have to figure out how that works. I'm gonna try this again. In just one second. Let's go in here again. So if I go from here to here all right and now it says 12,642.5 meters is this distance and that's the distance along this path right and then this is 76,000 uh, now remember by the way there these are sized to keep them in the same space uh, okay so they're not these images here on the left are not correct relative to each other because obviously look at the difference <clears throat> okay so uh we want to consider that that these are just compressed for scale on the left side so like when you go through here you'll see that it goes racing through the center of archimedes into the edge and then over here okay it doesn't move as fast even though we, we're moving it as fast okay because it's going through a smaller area so these are compressed scale on this side 
actual scale on this side for whatever uh, that if that ever helps you a little bit now let's see um if we go back to let's see layers now um let's go look at the lroc <clears throat> featured images now what does that mean featured images well there's some really cool images that are featured uh that are neat and have additional information uh here's one called the archimedes rock garden i've looked at this a number of times check this out as we close in to archimedes on one particular location uh, we have this area right here now well, we can turn off the selected images to see a little better okay but if we click this okay and then we click this which takes us now to a browser which shows us what we're talking about we actually see the Archimedes Rock Garden in full detail. See that? And there it is right there. Really interesting. And they, they call it that because these rocks just happen to be sitting here. And again, these passes are a little... They give you a scale. Space. Yeah, exactly right. Cool. And these, these passes are a little bit uh, better resolution, all right? Because the LRO is doing a better job. It is making, uh, you know, there's the example, okay? The LRO is giving us the information uh, you know, that's as good as we get for now, but here's the rock garden. Isn't that pretty? I mean, we see better resolution now when we go into some of those side, uh, some of those side uh I mean, topics. to be honest, there are more colorful gardens around. Yes, it's yeah, very neat. I know. <laughs> You're right. I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. But I, I want to say that, you know, when we, when we look at uh, you know, these specific featured odd objects, these are neat because they give us a chance to go looking at some cool things. All right. So, uh, for instance. I'm just thinking about the amount of work that went into putting this site together. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A lot like, not only is this a cool tool for, like, anybody to play around with, but almost guaranteed it's used by professionals daily. Well, it, it, yeah. It, it actually, not not this per se. This is sort of, a at best, it's rough for the professionals, Okay. But mm -hmm. where it takes you, it takes you to some of the other servers like the uh, International Astronomical Union site where you can get more data and dig into some of the science. Like if you looked at <clears throat> some of these other guys here, some of these other data availabilities, these guys down here, these are things that are very uh, – some of them are esoteric. You know, they only show uh, certain uh, features like spectral data. Um, and so forth, and that's that's important, but you know you, you have to figure out like what is important to you, okay? Um, now here we can see the uh, titanium dioxide abundance here by weight. By if we click this, okay. Well, <clears throat> I mean, uh, what does this map mean to anybody? Okay, that it is other than someone who's trying to make sense of the titanium dioxide abundances on the moon well, that's, that's what, what I, mean. I mean i mean it's there because somebody needed it and that's, they figured, that's right you know might as well post it for right you know public use right now this you know? is that's what i mean there has to be some professionals that use this daily that don't dive into the oh, heavy duty data back end that can get the information that they need straight off of the lro site itself right now this is gross data but this is shown in photo format but most of the researchers they don't look at photos they actually get data to crunch and they get numbers, they get values, data values, because this doesn't really help them much. They say, okay, okay, we now we know that Copernicus Crater has X amount of titanium dioxide. Okay, fine. Now what? Well, if we actually now uh, want to examine how it varies across the floor of Copernicus, well, then we have to get the data and, and start crunching the data across the whole floor of Copernicus Crater uh, and so forth. Uh, and there's, there's more to do. So this is, it kind of shows you uh, uh, a, a bit of the uh, uh, the behind the scenes. Then, you know, if you want to do it in color, well, then you can do it in color too. You know, and see it in color as well. And that's spectacular looking. Um, and it kind of gives you a rough idea. Now, as someone who's trying to teach people about the moon, say, these are very valuable data to show. Uh, and we could turn off uh, the LROC featured images here just to show the sphere. Okay, so you can see the areas that actually are very high in that abundance very clearly, all right? And I think that's uh, a really cool example of this stuff. So, and again, you have other uh, features like this that you can do uh, as well. Um, and I just want to uh, mention, 
that I think, uh, you know, when we look at the LROC featured images, uh, it, it goes without saying that we probably want to uh, find uh, the Apollo landers. Um, and I think we'll do that. Now, did for you before, I've already done the search. Here is within each of these features, you can do a search, okay? Uh, within many of them. And so when you type in here, if you type in Apollo, you get this list. So let's go take a look at Apollo 11, all right? And from a distance, basically, we're looking at all these different locations, okay? And we're gonna come down now to Apollo 11, which okay. is in the Sea of Tranquility here. There we go, we're back now. Okay, we're way okay. away. Yeah, we were away for a good seven, eight seconds. The oh. whole stream quit, and wow. now it's back. I can't believe that. I don't know why that's happening. We are back in the saddle, people. Welcome back. I think it catches up, too. I don't think it actually yeah. goes away. Well, right now it's looking at uh, yeah, your... Okay, I'm looking at the YouTube feed. It's... it's yeah, it's not that far behind. Okay, great. So, if we zoom in now on Mare Tranquillitatis, uh, where the eagle landed, uh, we can look and find the very, very small landing site uh, that occurred here. Uh, let me just uh, let me just turn this off for a second. Uh, and that's it's got to just back out a little bit. I have to get. Uh, it might be this one. I'm sorry. Here it is. Okay. Now we zoom in here, and I turn these features off so you can see it. And there you go. There's the lunar module base right there. This is the eagle sitting there on the moon as taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And guess what these are? These are the tracks. The astronauts dragged a little cart. They walked uh, across the moon. They walked to the edge of the crater here. And they set up experiments. That's the extent of the Apollo 11 trip, you know. It was just this little bit. But man, that was exciting as heck. But there it is, Apollo 11, as seen from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. But now, uh, how about Apollo 12? Apollo 12 was a little bit different. Apollo 12 actually was, if we come back over here, Apollo 12 was over here. I'm going to turn this back on just so I can get to you. All right. All right, here we have uh, Apollo 12. All right. And I think that's right here, correct? Yes. Uh, this is the uh, Apollo 12 landing site. Let me make sure we got that. There we are, and now as I zoom in, okay, once again, we're doing this dynamically within the LRO data. There, right in front of us, all right, is the Apollo 12 lunar lander that was known as Intrepid, right there. And you can see that Captain Bean and uh, who was the other astronaut on Apollo 12? I don't, I don't know, but that know. rover driver was drunk. Uh, no, there was no rover on this mission. Oh, look at all the motor they footprint tracks? Yes. Oh, okay. And cool. they walked around this crater. Stumbling like, around drunk on the moon instead of driving. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Surveyor. Effort, guys. <laughs> this is Surveyor Crater. Okay, this is, uh, why was it called that? Because two years earlier, before Apollo 12 landed here, uh, they actually had landed this probe right here. This is the Surveyor another soft landing site uh, probe, and you can see it has a long shadow behind it because of the way the sun was. And it's on a slope as well. So when you're on a slope and the sun is at a narrow angle, well, it's going to catch it, and, and there's a point in time where that shadow goes almost all the way to the bottom. That's yeah. the furthest you can go in on that? Yeah, this is half meter per pixel. Yeah. And now you're saying you can't even tell it's a surveyor, and you can barely tell it's a lunar module. You can, however, see the four foot pads because they're bright. See that one, mm -hmm. two, and then third one's buried in there, and fourth one's buried in there. But you can see the two of them, or the four. Pretty cool. And they walked around this. They came down the slope here, and they went over to the surveyor, and they touched it, and they, 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 they actually put their hands on it. There's a lot of photos showing uh, the astronauts holding the surveyor's uh, you know, uh, arm or whatever it was. And meanwhile, you see Intrepid in the distance. What a just amazing photo. Um, but this is the extent right here. You can see the extent of their travels uh, for this guy and then for Apollo 12. And then they did all this out here. They came out here. They did some, <clears throat> they set up some experiments out here. Okay. 
and you can see this one here which is actually giving a little shadow right there yeah. okay this one was uh i'm not sure that might be the all sep uh, uh experiment and uh so so now this is apollo 12 okay and we did apollo 11 apollo 12 <clears throat> what's next well we have apollo 13 which didn't happen and so we have apollo 14 <clears throat> sorry and apollo 14 was over here this is weird because this is in the middle of like these highlands area that this could have been ejected from more impacts elsewhere all right but as we come down here okay and we look and we zoom in and zoom in and this is the frau moro area and we turn this off so we can see it well now you can see there's the lunar lander there there are the tracks all right there are the tracks now this is interesting this goes all the way to all the way out to uh let's see where this ends i knew i had a i could see it before not quite now it kind of goes like to here okay and right there there it is that, that's where it goes to same experiment as before okay and this distance here i measured it before but i'll do it again the distance to this uh, lunar lander right here uh show, show you how far they they went Again, this is 14. This is before the uh, rover. They used the rover on 15, 16, and 17. If we measure how far they walked, okay, walked, all right, they went from the lunar lander over here all the way out to uh, right here. And let's just say here, and then we put this, uh, let me, uh, let's, let's measure it, and I'll show you how far they went. So from here, all the way to this is just a straight line too so it's even longer uh, by then to here and that distance turns out to be over a thousand meters okay a thousand twenty four meters okay that's a kilometer okay it's a kilometer guys and they did that walking they might say wow with that heavy outfit the whole heavy suit and everything yeah but don't forget in one sixth gravity they only weigh one sixth of what they would weigh on earth um but it is harder to walk in zero g uh, zero g in in uh, one sixth g so uh they actually you know did have to be very very careful about the way they balanced because if they could f if they fell they could end up piercing the suit uh especially if they're out here you know when that happened they they would never get back you know so this was an interesting uh you know uh, uh apollo 14 uh you know, excursion. They called it an uh, EVA, extravehicular activity. Uh, very neat. And uh, they went kind of to the uh, uh, to this crater. And when you say, well, what's that crater? Well, then I say, well, let's go look at the nomenclature. And, and they'll probably tell us that it was Cone Crater. Uh, but let's do nomenclature again, which is now down here. So we do that. And there we go. See, it's Cone Crater. And Cone Crater, when you say, well, what was Cone Crater? Cone Crater was an astronaut named feature of the Apollo 14 site. It was named by the uh, by the astronauts on site. I think that's pretty cool. You know, they got the name Craters. We don't get the name Craters. Yeah, I know, right? I know, right? So, this is cool and I want you to look at something else too, which is uh, one of the problems that people always mention. Uh, let's first of all, let's turn off the uh, No, we can leave nomenclature on. I want to uh, just get rid of my uh, line here for now okay notice something right here this is where the lunar lander came down do you see the area around this lunar lander it's sort of gray isn't it and kind of circular okay that's interesting right because we hear people say well you know if the lunar landers landed why didn't it scour out anything how come it's not scoured you know that that shows it was fake well actually this is present on almost all the lander sites because sometimes the photographic imagery is too bright or too whatever to, to see it. But uh, you can see this. This scour is there. This is the scour. Okay. This uh, darker material that was lying underneath this lighter material, apparently, is exposed. All right. And that's what we're seeing here. <clears throat> so we actually see it. And people say, well, wow, it looked like it landed dead center in a small crater. Actually, it didn't. It actually created this scour, which was along the surface. And... 
what people don't understand is they and and there's a calculation I actually did this calculation to show the the pressure coming out of the nozzle underneath the lunar module was only enough to help keep the the uh, the lunar lander from crashing into the moon and that amount that had to come out was very very low comparatively to what would be on earth on earth we would definitely you know, put a burn patch in the ground and so forth but on the moon it didn't happen there's no oxygen so there's no burning it's just moving gases See, and so that's really kind of cool. Uh, and when people understand how that works, they understand the the nature uh, of this this uh, this visit here to uh, to the moon when we went to the moon. So there was a scour. It's just that it wasn't readily visible from the astronaut taking photograph. You had to look at it from above. Well, there it is. Okay, you know we saw a similar one at Apollo 12. Um, and now, uh, let's say, so now we're, we're done there. Let's actually say, now we're next. Let's, where are we going to go next? Well, uh, let's go to Apollo 15. And Apollo 15's site, okay, is actually pretty well known. And that's over by Hadley Rill, which is up here. And uh, I believe it's right about here. <clears throat> okay, and so... Uh, this is Hadley Rill here, and let me just take off nomenclature because it just clogs up the uh, the view. And turn back on the LROC features, all right? And we can look and see that we have Hadley Rill here. Uh, and uh, I just want to, I can actually just show you right. Sometimes these labels, by the way, so like if we went right to this label, okay, we would actually be able to then go to this location here and see the actual tracks from the uh, descent stage of the Apollo 15. Okay, and Apollo 15's uh, name was Falcon. The lunar uh, module was called Falcon. Um, and so the descent stage is here. Notice there's a little scour again. Now the astronauts also walked around disturbing this area too. So that's why it looks mottled. Okay, but you'll see that wherever they walked, you have this darker area too. Now, they weren't walking in circles around this lunar module the entire time. That's not what we're seeing here. We're seeing part of this was the scour, all right? Um, all very impressive stuff. And this, is, again, is um, Apollo 15 uh, in the image. But now, how about actually on the moon? Well, if we actually look at the Apollo 15 uh, lunar, lasing, uh, lunar laser retro reflector, um, we come down to it right here, okay, and we go to the uh, featured images. We turn it off. Well, there we go. Now we see Falcon right here, and we see these experiments. Now we went to the. We saw these on the website before uh, when we went out and, and looked at the image. Now, this the lunar laser uh, that that laser retro reflector array is a bunch of little reflectors that look like reflectors that are on the back of a car. They're designed to reflect light, some portion of the light hitting it back to the observer. All right? That's how reflectors on a car work and on a bicycle and so forth. That's, that, that's, a, uh, that's a corner prism technology. And when we look, <coughs> excuse me, when we look at this uh, retro reflector array, it was uh, designed to allow us to shine a laser at the moon and then see the reflection fr from that laser and get an accurate distance to the moon that was very accurate because we were measuring it based on the timing it took for the light to go to the moon and back. Okay, Now, light travels at 186,282 miles per second. That's seven times around the Earth in a second. Uh, and it took just over a second to make the trip to the moon and back. So uh, when we saw this happen, we were able to calculate exactly how far away the moon was based on how fast we know light moves. And it's very, very accurate. And the uh, laser that you have to send up, or as you would say, Keith, you know, the laser beam, you know. Uh, Lasers. The laser beam. Scott! <laughs> the uh, laser would have to be very powerful, and it would send up a... And usually it's green. It's a green laser that they send up, and, and uh, uh, that's a question for everybody in the chat. Why did they use a green laser? And I'll just move on. Um, so answer that when you can. Um, that ranging would be used to actually determine... <laughs> the question is, 
Why did they use a green laser? Mm, yeah. Ponder and respond. That's it, yeah. Well, those little fun things along the way. So um, the, the, this, is, this, this ranging experiment was something they used to actually, you know, like I said, calculate the distance. Now, based on studies of the data from this experiment over the decades, um, we found that the moon is actually leaving our orbit, uh, the orbit it's in, by two centimeters a year. So eventually the moon will be free of the Earth uh, as it's spiraling away. Now, there's uh, you know, the whole reason has to do with momentum and you know, conservation of momentum and so forth. And, uh, and that, that's, we're not going to go into that. But I can tell you this, that the moon will be free of the Earth uh, well after it has already been destroyed by the sun. <laughs> you know, it's going to take many more billions of years than the sun has left to survive. So... Uh, and when the sun does finally use up the last of its hydrogen, it will end up swelling from its evolutionary uh, death throes. It'll swell into a red giant that will swallow Mercury, Venus, and probably the Earth. And, of course, by default, the moon. So um, the moon is spiraling away, but it won't get away <laughs> you know, before it's destroyed. Everybody's going to die. And everybody is going to perish on the planet until we... Uh, so that's, that's, But you know what? That's not a worry. You know why? Uh, because even if that was happening, you know, in uh, 100,000 years or 50,000 years from now, um, we would be working out a way to get off the planet. And we would have already had that working out. Um, because we think ahead, don't we? Us humans. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to think so. Anyway. We're smart. We're smart. Yeah, we are. Yeah. So there we go. So now this was uh, uh, this was Apollo 15, and you can see that their traverse went this way. They did use a rover. Um, 15, 16, and 17 had rovers. Uh, and the nice thing is, if we uh, if we want to see an annotated image, I think we can do this uh, or not. I thought we had an annotated. Oh, you know what? I gotta. This is the weird thing. Sometimes. You gotta. They, they they put the identifier in a different place because they just haven't figured things out yet. Yeah. At the right side, okay. This is higher res. If you'll notice, it's actually a little bit closer, 50 meters. Okay. There's the lunar rover right there. Now the rover rover's going this way, and you can see the little dish on top of the rover, that little signal antenna, and then you see the shadow of the rover. Isn't that cool? And this is a very very strong path because that's the rover track. Uh, again, followed by the astronauts having walked back to it. So if you take this line and you measure this, you'll see that the astronauts walked about 150 meters, over 320 feet, from where they parked the rover back to the lunar module to then climb on board and leave. Very, very cool. All right. Uh, so it's really neat uh, to, to watch this and to see this. Um, because you literally see the mission basically having transpired. Now, but do you know there um, there is a reason why the lunar rover is out that far? Why they left it out there? Yes, that's true. And and uh, do you want to tell me about me? Uh, I believe, if my memory serves me correct, it's out there it. because it was what was going to be filming the takeoff. Very good. Of the uh, back into orbit. That is and it was remote controlled, and they had to do it on an eight second delay. Yes. <laughs> which yeah. made it incredibly difficult, but they managed to do it, and that's why you have all these conspiracies saying, well, who was there filming the thing taking off on the moon? Well, there's your answer. The camera was on the rover. Yeah, but I think the only good one they got was Apollo 17. Yeah, I believe so. Because 15, they miscalculated. This was a failed one. <laughs> yeah, and 15, they miscalculated, and it, 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 it either went up too fast. Or the the uh, the lunar module left the site long before the camera panned up, or something like that. Um, and those are available online; you can see them. Uh, but that's yep. really cool. Yeah. Now, just one other thing to point out is uh, this little this little guy. Where is it? Let me see. Uh, I'm not sure if it's this right here or this. It, I think it might be this little guy right here. This is is this or this are the flags. Okay, and they have a little shadow behind them, uh, and uh, there's uh, there's other there's other images of these landing sites which illustrate these and show these better. Um, so I think that's pretty neat. Uh, I'm very very uh, happy to show this all to you, 
Yeah, because you know when it comes to trying to determine whether we went to the moon or not, uh, I defy you, any of you that are not not my loyal listeners and and viewers, but uh, many of the people that make these claims about the uh, NASA lies, NASA lies, these are all fake. You have to look at the wealth of imagery, and you have to figure. If they were faking things, it would have cost them more than to actually go to the darn moon. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just crazy. But anyway, uh, so that's uh, Apollo 15. And now if we pull out, uh, we can go to Apollo 16 and 17, which were uh, in the highlands, which is kind of interesting. Um, and that is Taurus Littrell Valley. Okay, this is Apollo 17. So let's go to 16 first. And is this 16 down here? I don't think so. This isn't 16. Or is it? No. Oh, hang on. I'll get it. And guys, look at how much we've actually looked at tonight. This is only just a small sampling. Oh, yeah. This I mean, is you nothing. can literally go anywhere you want to on the moon, near side or far side. Right. That's right. So this is where we are. Okay, this is the And if you get a chance, to check out Jackson Crater on the back side. I would recommend it. It is known as Tycho's Twin I will because they it. look almost exactly the same, but they're on opposite sides of the moon. Yeah, and, and we actually, uh, you know, we've only been playing on the front side. Yep. Okay. So as we zoom in here, okay, this is Apollo 16's landing site. You notice from right out here, it's like there's, let me just. <laughs> Can I just throw this out there? You may. I get, I get, a, I get a text message from Paul, right? Yeah. <laughs> just now. And it's nothing. It's just the the bubble that the text is supposed to be in. <laughs> <laughs> maybe like maybe Paul he's sleeping. Not, he he'll be the first to admit that he's not the best like texter and typer and everything. Oh, like funny. every one of his sentences has mistakes and misspellings and all that stuff. But n now it's just getting to the point where it's not even sending any letters. It's just a bubble. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's that's funny. Uh, and if he's texting me now, that's telling me that he's maybe thinking about going for one tonight. So I'll find out if if we decide oh, to. I'll let you know. Well, let's uh, let's uh, get through this, and then maybe uh, you can go straight into that. Yeah, so, there's a possibility. Um, so now this is uh, now this is going to be Apollo 16's site, and Apollo 16 is right there. You can see the lunar module right there. Um, I don't remember the name of the Apollo 16 lunar module. Um, oh, it's um, it, uh, you know what? I, that was a question. It's not Eagle. It's not Intrepid. It's not Antares. It's not Falcon. It's not Challenger. That's seventeen. So what is sixteens? That's a question for the chat. Well, see, they can just look it up in Google. Um, yeah. But remember my other question I asked earlier too. Um, just a few. It was like now you're gonna have me stumped. Um, I don't remember, but I remember it was something like. I don't remember. No, I thought it was going to come to me. But You're right. Not. It was, I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, was, I don't remember. Oh, that's funny. Uh, so this we can see. Now, you notice that the shadow helps call out these objects on the moon. Um, and again, here are the tracks. And I want you to also notice this bright spot here. That's a, a lunar experiment that was set up there. Here's tracks right here. Okay, and they're kind of wide and broad because it was the rover that was driving here. All right. Same thing over here. Um, here they did a donut. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I don't know what it was. They actually tried well, to Pop, do wait, what's the, what's the, what was, because it was like a weird area that it landed to, and I know you're there now, but what, like, what's the name of the area that Apollo 16 landed in? This was Taurus Littrow. No, it's a Snoopy. It was like Des, Des, Desperados or Des, uh, shoot. Yeah, no, you're right. But, but wasn't this, wasn't it Snoopy? Didn't they name this? Is it Snoopy? Snoopy? Wasn't this Snoopy? Uh, it might have been. I think it was Snoopy. That's and you know what? I Ted thought. Bronson said Snoopy in the chat. Okay. I, I'm not seeing the chat, uh, Ted. Thank you. Um, I got so many billions of windows open here, but it, it's okay. Yeah, I think it was Snoopy. So I, I, I don't know. Here. I have to search, but... Um, Descartes Highlands. That's yeah, Descartes Highlands. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But there you go. And again, notice here, folks, this gray area right here. All right? This, this gray area around the lander. Once again, uh, disturbed soil caused by the uh, spherical and uh, radially oriented, uh, not, uh, not not the uh, radial spray, I should say, the radial exhaust from the lander. Okay, 
So for the people to say it didn't have any effect, look at it. Here it is. You got to see it from above. You got to see it from a distance. And uh, we're actually, I mean, this is 30 miles. <laughs> okay. So yeah. uh, this is uh, pretty good uh, imagery for 30 miles away. Again, imagine being 30 miles away and imaging something here on Earth from a distance of 30 miles. Would you see the tracks, uh, you know, that a car leaves in the mud 30 miles away? Maybe in the salt flats. That's about it. Yeah, exactly so. Yeah, exactly. Maybe in the salt flats if it was properly reflective. But, yeah, exactly. So there we go. And then we're leaving Apollo 16 behind. Look, we come out to 8 meters per pixel. And it's lost. We can't even see where it was. You know, uh, and once again, lesser resolution, like over here, these are individual pixels, and you can see that they're solid colors. This is high resolution, this is not. As we zoom out, you get to a certain point where, okay, like right about here, you can sort of see what this is meant to be. But boy, oh boy, what a difference in the resolution, what it can provide. Because here we see this really, really detailed uh, these craterlets and so forth with. Uh, debris and stuff in here, and we're not even all the way down. Okay, like this. Now we are, right? You can see little uh, little uh, boulders here, uh, and then coming out, we really can't tell what we're looking at here. It looks like a some type of a digital painting almost, um, but it's actually a uh, it's a problem with the uh, moon base. resolution. Yeah, and moon base. Yeah. Now I just want to point out this over here for people that notice it. Okay, this is actually. Uh, an error in the stitch that occurred here uh, when they were putting it together. This is just a, you know, it, it happens. It's not uncommon. Um, you know, this is the, the seam. The seam wasn't fluid here. The data wasn't complete. Here's another double up. You know, there's another double of the same object shown again uh, two, different, you know, two different times. Uh, this happens from time to time um, when the uh, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was trying to uh, grab data. You have to understand it's a monumental task to make what you see here actually take place. You Literally. Know, monumental task, yep. So. And thank God that there was people that wanted to get this project off the ground and, and get it out there. Oh, yeah. You, can you, you imagine know? that? I mean, there, there were... This is probably one of the best uh, ways that NASA has spent your tax dollars. I think it's true. I think it's true. You know, now... Don't forget, now, I, I think that the, uh, the, the nicest part of this uh, for me and for you will probably be the all these different things are great. All these different uh, overlays are wonderful. Um, but I think what you, you'll really <coughs> like is the, the, ability to, um, the ability to go into that 3D mode. And that's, again, uh, up here in the switching and the projections. We talked about the projections. We talked about the overlays. We talked about. We didn't talk about Boolean. I told you I wasn't going to do that tonight. Um, hey, Jello asked, how often do they scan this for an update? Uh, I'm not sure what the uh, what what it, what that is, and you know, in terms of the uh, frequency. Uh, but I do know that I noticed from the last time that I dug into the to the uh, Quick Map browser to this time that when I had zoomed in on some of the data and I did a <clears throat> a straight profile through the data. I expected a straight line, and I got the curves. I got the data. So that particular location had been up or or the, the resolution changed. Um, so uh, I do know that it, they're still doing it because uh, I saw the difference immediately when I did that test. It surprised me, as you saw. So mm -hmm. like this this particular crater, and you'd say, well, wait, what crater is that? Well, let's find out if it's even named. If, I'm not, not sure how my uh, if we got this. This is uh, Calippus. Oh, Calippus, see that? Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't look round, okay? It kind of looks... It's, I'm kind of glad they don't let us name craters, truthfully. I mean, in this day and age. Like, say if there had to be a new impact and there was a crater <laughs> there and they, yeah. they ran a public thing, it would just get trolled like that boat, boat in England. Like, oh, yeah, public thing, let's name a boat. And it ended up like this majestic boat and naming like Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you know, it, we'd have a stupid crater, you know, named like Jassel Crater. <laughs> Huge asshole, right? <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. we, it would just it would just be total trolling. It's just like okay, just leave it to them to name stuff. Well, I wanted to, I, I got to show you this real real quick before we go to Jackson on the backside. Um, when when people look at the craters, 
Yes, I know. And Pythagoras, yes. When, we, when people look at the craters, they say, well, they're all the same depth, they're all the same heights, all that. Let this, let this profile show why that is not true. Okay, here, the highest spot over here you can see is uh, it, it's at, at like minus uh, 50 uh, below the mean radius of the moon. Then this comes down here. It's a sloping bottom. It's not flat, notice. And then it goes up to positive uh, 2,100, uh, or actually say right here, uh, to uh, positive, uh, uh, what was that, uh, 1,944 meters, okay? The craters are not symmetrical, uh, you know, by and large, and they're also on sloping surfaces. The bottom of this crater slopes upward from here, okay? And it's also uneven on the bottom. So you see, this is the fact. These are the truths about craters right here you're seeing. This isn't uh, you know, the crater's not all the same. You know, they're not. Um, now, if they're all flooded on a maria like this, well, then the bottom of this crater could be similar to the bottom of this crater if they were all flooded, all right? But that's not usually the case, all right? And I and just to prove it, let's, let's do this. Let's look at this crater right here. And first of all, we'll go back to our layers. We'll turn on nomenclature for a second and just grab the names so we can look at them. This one's Archimedes and that one's Aristillus. Okay, so Archimedes and Aristillus. Now let's go to our tool here, query tool. Let's draw a line through uh, Archimedes and let's just get the depth of the bottom of Archimedes. Okay, and so now we're looking at it. It's also on a slope, if you'll notice. See the number that says Val down below? Mm -hmm. All right, that is changing. That's showing you the 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 moment to moment value at the bottom of that that crater. So at this end of the crater, it's negative twenty six seventy four meters from uh, below the mean radius of the moon, and this it's negative twenty seven sixty. So twenty seven sixty, all right, uh, to uh, twenty six sixty nine actually. Okay, so clearly this is sloping up. All right, so let's take that number and now let's go compare it to another. Uh, one that we do. Let's go take another one. And we'll do one right here, and we'll just go through uh, this crater as well. We'll go through Aristillus. Okay. Now there'll be a central peak, but we can get part of the bottom, and that's what we're looking for. Okay. So now we got this part of the bottom, and what's this? Well, here now look at the bottom. Is this the same depth? It's minus four thousand five hundred eighty-two meters. This crater is almost two thousand meters deeper than this crater. See, and they, yet they look the same, don't they? That's the illusion, okay? And here it is, plain and simple. Minus uh, 2748, minus, uh, where are we? Minus uh, 4593, okay? Actually, minus 4590, all right? So there you go. This right here is all you need to understand that the craters are all at different, different depths. And while we're at it, we have another crater here. Let's go ahead and look at that too. What is this one, okay? This crater here, which I didn't even check the name yet. I don't know the name of that crater. What's its depth? It's minus 4587 uh, to 4557. 45, basically minus 4500. Okay. Minus 4593, so almost minus 4600. Uh, and 4565. And then, of course, this one here, minus 2700. So they're all different. They're all different. And that's... That's very important to understand, you know. And just for ha-has, let's just see if we can grab the depth of this crater, this little guy. Okay. Now, this little guy over here, it's sitting at minus 3610. All right. So this is right here, just this one little section of the moon. We clearly see that the depths are all very, very different. The data is right here for you to see. And if someone didn't believe you, you can hit download the comma-separated values and plot it in Excel or on, on a graph uh, system all you want, all right? And that's the cool thing. Now, that's just uh, that's the number, that's the types of things that we like to do, you know, and this is fun for this. It's great for the public outreach and to show people all about the moon. Now, um, we're going to look at Pythagoras, too. Uh, I, <laughs> but I do want to do... Um, I do want to do uh, something else, and I want, how am I going to do this? Let's see. Uh, I know we can do this. I'm trying to actually get us to um, a point where we might be able to uh, say, say we, wanna, say we want this picture of Copernicus. 
there is a way to uh, get these pictures. Capernicus. Yeah, uh, this Capernicus, yeah. Um, and uh, and do that. Now, if I say view image of this, uh, that's 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 the image right there. Okay, but that's not uh, what I want to do. Um, in fact, I'm I'm uh, okay. Copy this thing. Uh, <laughs> You can set them right as your desktop background, right from the site. Yes, you can, and I kind of like that. I'm just gonna save this little ping file. It saves as a ping file out. Okay, uh, and let's see now if I uh, go back. I might be able to just pop back into my browser. All right, but you can also uh, do a download from here of the actual. Uh, 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 crater and so forth right from here and I gotta I think that I'm trying to find out where we can do that there was was it here was it really in the layers I'm missing that that's okay I'll find it for you okay but incidentally by the way just so you know um, and, and then we're gonna go check out Keith's favorite topics here um, we're looking at the wide angle camera mosaic plus the narrow angle camera mosaics what's that well this is wide angle camera as we get closer though uh, we see that it it starts to change, and now we start getting these strips. These are the narrow angle cameras uh, mosaics showing up. So and the you can't do the the three D angle or three D ish angle on on this. Oh no no yes you can. Oh we're, you can. We're, yeah okay. we're just in this. The whole moon is available for that. So nice. like if we go to let's do that actually. So uh, and, and the last thing I want to mention about this though is this okay. Um, the the wide angle camera mosaic plus Nax that's the standard thing you see that's the baseline. However, you can also do wide-angle camera for the near side with shadows, okay? So this is a different set of data showing you, uh, you know, some different shadows. These are big shadows, okay? Uh, we can do it with a wide-angle camera showing no shadows. See? Same As thing. As we like to call them, full moons. Yes. Uh, we can also do normalized color, which is kind of interesting. Uh, because now we're actually seeing this is a little bit over the top. It's not quite. It's a little exaggerated color. Okay, but this Vegetation. is this is more or less what the moon really looks like. All right, and you can see that the soils, especially like in this area, you can see how the soils are very different. Look at Aristarchus over there. Yeah, just crazy coloration over in that. Yes, but see, we don't even. It's not even, you, know, you don't even recognize it, okay, if we come out, okay, and we get out of this uh, particular, uh, wait, that's not Aristarchus. What are we doing? No, Oops, Aristarchus sorry. off to the left. Yes, I was off, I was in the wrong place. I apologize. I was looking at something else. It's over here. So yeah, now I turn yeah. the color back on. It Let just pops yeah. like crazy. Yeah. Okay, so now let's go back and look at that, uh, you know, the uh, the happy key normalized color. Look at that. Holy yeah. moly. Well, it's, of course, it's overexposed, and if you notice... You see the pixels? Again, this particular map was created using a lower resolution than the baseline NACs, you know, the narrow angle camera stuff on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter. So clearly we don't see this uh, in the highest of resolution. But as Keith said, it does pop. And you can see the very the big differences. You also can see the uh, ray structure very nicely with these. And I like how... The ray structure kind of is very evident here. Um, I have a favorite area, though, actually, and that's actually this right here. This little sweeping area. See that? That little area doesn't make any sense. You know, what would have created that? Now, circular objects on the moon are created by impacts. But this, if this was some kind of remnant of a, a, a basin or an impact, might it have been associated with this area. Uh, way in the distant past, and then this area was overlain with more craters. See, that whole area just looks like it was pizza cut out of another area and placed there. It does kind of, and that's 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 probably because of the way these these lines look so sharp. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, this this is typical of like when you have uh, certain types of uh, uh, lavas that are cooling. Sometimes they they have sharp edged borders, like in Hawaii. Uh, or it could just be that this was a different uh, different type of sample that was taken. Maybe this really isn't so sharp. Uh, again, like I said, 
you saw the pixelation down here. Who knows whether this was actual or actual or an artifact of some type? Again, we're not. You're only seeing the data that's being publicly made available, so you can't actually look at this as a scientist for, per se and use it for your purposes. You need to get a hold of the real program data from the real analysis, and that is like you're going to get multiple. You know, if you're going to go for DVDs and get hard copies, you're going to end up with multiple DVDs of data because uh, it's probably terabytes of data just for this area because, you know, this is very complete. Um, so <clears throat> now normally this is what this area looks like, okay? And you can actually see that there is some type of delineation here. And what would cause it to look so different? We don't know. You know, we don't know. We only have a guess. Now if we turn off the whack and mosaic, we get nothing because, you know, that's what the baseline is. Just uh, think that's pretty interesting. So these, this is that's the LROC uh, wide angle camera base maps that you're looking at here, okay? And most people want to see the narrow angle with that, and that's why when we zoom in, okay, we have wide angle, okay, and now the narrow angle camera starts coming in. You see, and that's what these swaths are. Is the NAC, the narrow angle camera? Now looking in Aristarchus again, uh, let's just take a look at. This terracing here. Now this is just fascinating to, to most people that look at this. Each of these terraces developed because of a particular uh, process that was occurring during the impact. And it was probably uh, related to uh, the, the energy of the impactor, the angle of the impactor, which was sort of at a little bit of a glancing blow. But on impact, much of the energy is distributed which is why craters are pretty much circular all the time. It, the, the energy is distributed evenly, but the debris may not be. The debris is going to follow the uh, momentum of the original impactor. So that's why we're seeing this over here, okay? Uh, but when you look at the ray structure for the lighter material that we see, which actually shows up better in this color view, um, you'll see that it seems to be radial in all directions. That's showing you that the, the, the lighter particles were... Uh, able to just be splattered out evenly in every direction but the heavier stuff ended up being dumped on this side and that right right there that tells you something about how this crater was formed all right just again an amazing uh an amazing journey an amazing uh, ability to, to view these different processes because you're literally watching them Right now, you're watching them live. You're seeing how not not well not live, but you're you're seeing it with the latest data that was acquired. And I'll tell you what, Mark, live in the stream, I'm, I'm going to have to exit very shortly because somebody in Miami wants to set up and go it. <laughs> well, then I will I will uh, I will uh, end the stream in that in that. Uh, on that no, no, feel free to continue. Well, I want to actually do uh, one two more places to, and I'll do this for you. Because I want to actually go uh, find and get the. Uh, uh, I want to show you the the um, uh, nomenclature. I want to look for Pythagoras and find it. Um, you know, Pythagoras, where are you? There was my search. Okay. So Pythagoras. All right, and here's Pythagoras. All right, now, this is how Pythagoras looks, okay? Notice as we zoom in. Um, look at that giant laser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look so peaky now, does it? Yeah, it doesn't have the same effect, does it? No, it doesn't. A trick of light and shadow. Yeah, yeah. And this is the shadow. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, Pythagoras has a central peak in it, you know, and it, it's not really this uh, sharp peak or anything. It's just the way that the the, uh, the light falls and the way the shadow falls, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are looking at things in a kind of an angle. It's not 3D, but we're also at the limits of the projection that we're looking in. Um, but it does look really cool in the scope. You have to give it that. It really oh, sticks I, out with that, love how it. that light and shadow hit. I do. I think it's phenomenal. All right. I really do. Because it's a giant freaking laser. <laughs> and this is this is Pythagoras now in the three D mode. Okay. So yeah. this is now how we can view Pythagoras. And the reason that we understand we, the reason we see that it has this look like a gun is because of the shape of the central peak, notice. 
See that? That shape is what makes it this way. And then, of course, we can always pick now our uh, go around the selected point, and this is what we're doing. We're going to be we're visiting Pythagoras in a variety of ways. Is that cool or what? I just think I've got to get this crater from you. i got to make this crater for you. And yeah. I'll, yeah. And I'll, I don't I, have. I, I'm going to make it. i got to uh, just grab it. Uh, our, our longitude is, uh, and this is like, uh, well, our, our latitude is uh, 63 and the longitude minus 63. And uh, I get to, to 60 um, with the regular data. So I have to uh, put together the uh, the other data that the uh, they sent me from the uh, United States Geological Survey. And by the way, guys, if you want 3D printed moon craters, get them from Mark. I have seen other places uh, putting them up and putting them on plaques and everything, and they are charging an absorbent amount of money for them. When you can get them for a reasonable price from Mark, you know, don't go out there and pay, you know, $105 for a 4x4 four four crater, you know, wow. on who's a cheap wooden plaque. Who's selling those? I've seen them online. I actually look because when I was looking up yours, they come up as like recommended stuff. Oh, yeah. And, I went, and they don't even look nowhere near as good. They have the stepping to them. They have the layer. It's just you can tell they're not finished the way yours are. No, they're trying to cut a deal. They're right. trying to cut corners and hoping people will yeah. just be, you know, uh, you know, uh, not intelligent buyers. And that, that really bothers me because, you know, people deserve to have really good stuff. Yeah. Well, do a search. I mean, you, you'll find them. You'll find the other people doing them. Yeah. And it's just they, they can't compare to the quality anyway. Well, that's that's good to know, actually. And if they want to actually come close to what we're doing, they're going to actually end up being uh, quite uh, quite busy, to be honest. Exactly. All right, let me. Uh, yeah, the craters are awesome. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Let's that's why I get out. so many from you. Yeah, that's I why I try so hard not to pay you for any of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and he doesn't, folks. Okay. I don't. I don't. No. It's just right. every time I visit Mark's house, it just so happens he's missing three craters every time I come over. <laughs> I know. And what's going on? I just never. Where'd they go? They were I here. got 28 crit. Wait a minute. Keith was here. I got 25 craters <laughs> filled. Uh, yeah, exactly. That, that's yeah. just, just, that's exactly right. <laughs> Jeez. All right. I got to bounce. I got to get this stream set up and reset and everything. All right. But I want to thank you a lot for having me. I did learn a lot more tonight than I didn't know. About this LRO site, uh, much appreciated. Oh, of course, man. I think that you. Uh, I'm pretty sure this won't be the last LRO stream either, because there's a lot more to learn yet. Yeah, there's a little, little bit more, but you know what? Uh, I think people are very happy with uh, what we've done so far. Yeah. Yes, and people go to the site, use it. Yeah, I just want you to you see know, this crater there before you. we go. You Look at your this. money paid for it. Go do it. Now, if you have all... any questions about the usage of it, I'm pretty sure Mark would very. Uh, Kindly answer any questions sure that you have. Sure, I will. And if you notice, yeah. by the way, uh, this this last crater I'll show you. Uh, this is an example of a crater that isn't round. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. All right, this is they a. They do sp exist. Well, see, here's the thing. Um, White buffalo. Think about this. If you throw a, a skipping stone across the water, every place it skips makes a circular pattern of ripples, right? They're not making yeah. elliptical patterns. They're making circular patterns. Well, that's the energy distribution, and that's how craters form the same way. But we're looking at the skipping stone effect here, and uh, you can see that the crater was starting to be round. This one's starting to be round, but there's a little extra on the ends because of the fact, and they're actually kind of blended together. There's a little extra on the ends because when the the, the soil is not water, it's actually it's 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 it's, uh, it's it's particles. It's it's solid matter that's uh, not water. So Clearly, uh, and it's in a vacuum, so you know the the physics is a little bit different. But man, alive, this is the coolest thing, you know. And for those that want to see illusions, this could be an illusion and of an open yeah, shell. Yeah, it looks like a fossilized like area, like you would see on Earth. Yeah, right, doesn't it? Like in a small area, it kind of looks like where a fossil would have been. Right. Yeah. It's neat. Yeah, it looks like a, a shell. All right, man. Cool. I will. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you much, sir. Sure. I appreciate it, uh, everybody. If you're planning on viewing the stream, it'll be 20, 25 minutes or so. And uh, whoever joins us over there, good. We'll see you over there. I'm not sure how long we're going or what we're doing. He just said, let's go for it. And well, I got to go set up. It's 11. So that's what I'm going to do. It's 11.07 <laughs> Eastern Standard Time right yep, now. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you once again, Mark. I really hey, appreciate it. And Keith, I'll talk to you your, very soon. I'm glad you came along. And I'll talk to you later. And for those wondering where Amanda is, um, she's. Uh, I tried to contact her earlier. She's probably uh, sleeping or something because uh, she really spent a lot of time up 
uh, you know, the last day or so. So uh, this, I'm sure it's a welcome relief for her. <laughs> anyway, yeah. all right, Keith, I'll talk to you later, man. And uh, Thank you. All right, so long, and Keith is out of here. I'm out of here. Awesome. Very good. So there we go. Now uh, let me just turn down some music a little bit. So, hang on a second. I'm just going to uh, grab something here. One second. All right. So now, yeah, okay. All right. I just wanted to turn down the music a little bit. Um, I don't know how loud that is to all of you out there. So, uh, bear with me on that. And now, let's see. I'm going to. Uh, got to bring up another screen because what I want to do now, now that Keith is out of here, I can probably uh, probably bring up the stream and see the chat and bring the chat up. Anyway, I hope you guys are enjoying this so far. I'm eh, pretty close to being done, you know, but I want to give you a little more bang for the buck, so to speak, and we'll do that in a second. Um, well, let's see what we got here. All right, uh, I'm going to pop out the chat. All righty. Okay, and now I can just get rid of that screen and have the chat up. There we go. Okay, I'm all set. Now, if you guys got any uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer them. It's up to you. And now, here's the thing. So now, uh, on this side, as we look now, I know that uh, you know, we, when we look at some areas on the moon on the back side, I wanted to show us. I wanted to show you one particular area that's neat. Um, this, uh, let's see here. There it is. I mentioned this early on. Uh, this is the Aiken Basin right here. This is the lowest spot on the moon. How do we know? Well, you should be able to know by now. You can go over and get your probe. All right. Let me just see if I can get the probe. Why is it not probing? Hang on a second, guys. Let me just. Oh, I know why. Uh, I've got to do it using the non 3D projection, of course. So we're going to do the orthographic far side projection. Some of the tools are limited. Uh, and then I'm going to turn off uh, the nomenclature. Um, but I am going to do one thing turn this off. And now I'm going to just do a search. For uh, Jackson Crater. All right, and now we'll see where Jackson Crater is. This is what's called Tycho's Twin on the far side. Now, where is it? It's right about there. Okay, this is the only Maria on the far side, along with this one here. This is Tsiolkovsky uh, Crater. This is Mare Moskoviens. Um, and this is where. Uh, Jackson is. Let me just get there again. Jackson is, as I said, it's it's like Tycho's twin, and we are in an area now that's uh, all all highlands here. It's it's fairly close to the highest spot on the backside of the moon. Um, but let's do our little probe, as I mentioned, and let's do a little line and check it out. All right, there we go. So now you'll see that uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, the this side of the moon here. This there's highlight, there's high areas of like 4,900 uh, meters above the mean radius, uh, and then uh, this one is actually 6,000 meters above the mean radius. So the heights are are higher on the back side relative to the mean radius of the moon. But let's go down to the Aiken Basin and get an idea about how high this area is just so you can see because when we look at this it really becomes obvious and we just draw a line you'll see the arc too it's pretty obvious okay so there we go and now as I draw a line through this down here through the middle area of the of the basin here okay minus 4600 minus 4800 um, and then minus 5500 minus 7,000 uh, uh, meters below the mean radius. This is, is really just a, a tremendously deep location. All right. And that area of greatest depth is right here. All right. And it's again, 
The Aiken Basin was this impact that uh, was the uh, very large impact made the, the low spot. But when it did that, when it hit, it made these ripples that went farther up the moon and went and made the highest spot on the moon, which I'm embarrassed to say I can't readily point to right off the bat. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna actually try to just sort of find it and see if I can find it. Uh, the highest spot in the moon was actually made by this impact down here at the same time, which is really kind of cool. So uh, let's see. This is. Oh, look at that. I'm actually pretty close. It's actually, uh, this is 7,000 meters above the highest spot, uh, above the mean radius, I mean, of the moon. And that is right about here. And that's, uh, that, that's, that may not be the exact spot, but it's close, I can tell you that. Uh, and so that's, that's about where that is. And the way that happened was, and looking at it from this far out, it's kind of good. Uh, the impact hit here, and the entire moon was hit so hard that it made ripples of shock waves that moved forward like this. And one of those ripples ended up freezing, you know, and solidifying uh, up here. And it made this whole area a lot higher than other areas on the moon. And uh, that was really cool. So that, that's the Aiken Basin. It's on the far side. We don't get to see it. Uh, but you'll notice that there's some dark gray in here. Uh, so there is some areas here where the the uh, values of the the, uh, the height are similar to the other side uh, but only because of this major impact but for the reasons i mentioned before the back side is a lot thicker and we see that the 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 back side actually uh, it has more mass in it so the moon is sort of oblong in a way and uh again it's it's locked to us so the the other side of the moon Okay, that is to say the side that we always see, okay, which is this side right here, okay. This side of the moon is locked to us, um, yet it's the the side that's least massive. The other side's more massive, so you might think, well, wouldn't it just spin around the other way? Shouldn't the most massive point uh, be the thing that's most attracted by gravity? And the answer would be yes, but the fact is we're looking at very large bodies here. The moon is small relative to other bodies in the solar system, but it's it's large enough so that when it has a, a large mass on its backside, it's large enough so that its its momentum is such that as it's going around the Earth, it could have flipped the other way so that the that we could have had this side facing us, okay? But instead, we ended up with this side facing us, and that's the way it stayed. Now, is it conceivable that maybe someday something could happen? Uh, well, maybe, you know, a, a major impact could cause it to, uh, to uh, flip around, maybe, perhaps, but you know, the, it's a delicate balance, um, but the moon is, is right now tidally locked, so if it did do a rotation or move around us, I suspect that, or move around rather, spin, I imagine that that would actually probably cause it to uh, uh, be uh, broken apart in some fashion. Uh, it might not ever uh, get back, you know. Um, and uh, Charles, you're asking a question, do the backside craters have a different depth profile? Yeah, actually they do. Uh, and I did show you that, I think, a few minutes ago when I was talking about the uh, uh, the Aiken Basin altitude uh, versus the uh, areas north of the moon. We had uh, a depth profile where it, most of it was way up in the, uh, you know, much higher, up to uh, 6,000 feet, uh, 6,000 meters rather, above the mean moon radius. So yeah, I think that uh, there is a different profile. The, the front end, the front here is uh, a lot generally a lot lower we can actually just go quickly look at that uh, and we say okay let's take our query tool let's go across Copernicus and see what we got from way out here to way out here all right so there we go and here in Copernicus we have minus 3,500 now on the back side of the moon we are like you know very much more minus 4,500 and, and lower so we don't have that here on the front side you know and Copernicus is a fairly big impactor you know so uh, it is very different, you know, depending on where you are on the moon, you know. <clears throat> and I'm just thinking that uh, in terms of how the moon developed, there's really no better way to see it, I think, than just to dive into this tool. Um, so uh, just just let me know what you guys think uh, about this, this look at the moon via the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Quick Map. 
if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Um, and again, you can actually reach me through our KGRA, uh, our KGRA radio email, which is skytourradio at kgraradio.com if you'd like to go there uh, and do it. Um, and uh, I, uh, I check that out all the time, so I'd be happy to answer any questions you had. Uh, and if, if you have any ideas for like future shows, radio shows, that, that'd be wonderful because we're going to be going to two hours in January, and that's going to be a, a whole different uh, ball game for us. It's going to give me time. It's going to give us time to actually explore things with you know, a, a little bit better analogies, a little more uh, uh, thought that uh, we don't have to rush through. It's going to be really kind of cool. Um, and if you, uh, like I said, if you want to know again what the, where this is, this is the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Quick Map. And Quick Map is all one word, Q-U-I-C-K-M-A-P. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to actually sign off and be done with the stream because I can't believe how long that this short uh, one hour stream was uh, turning into <laughs> but uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it because I really enjoyed uh, taking you through this I love this tool and I'm going to quit the stream and guess what I'm going to do I'm just going to keep right on playing and going through and doing some other uh, detailed analyses you know I just like the ability to dive in dive in dive in dive in okay and just get down there now for those of you out there that have heard us do this before, um, you know this this is uh, empty data here. There's lack of data here. That's why it's black. Uh, but this particular crater that we see, and of course you can see that it has some uh, boulders down at the bottom and a few craterlets and pits, um, and there's some boulders on the slope here. Um, this crater has a it's a specific type of crater. Uh, and what kind is this? Do you know? And, uh, you know, versus, say, Copernicus, you know, uh, just uh, just tell me what you think. And that's, uh, and that's the same as this one. This is also one of the similar types, as are many of them about this size, you know. But I think if you look at, uh, at the, the, the various types, uh, you will enjoy, I think, understanding that this, uh, these types of craters that form here are all related to the physics of impact. And I think these are the coolest things in the world. I actually do a, a I used to do a, a, a class where I would actually create craters with people. And they would do it with me. I, would, I created this uh, you know, fake lunar soil. We used flour and, and, and some gray powder. And we would put the flour down and put the gray powder on top. And we'd have these little meteors. And it would be a bucket of this stuff. And uh, the craters class was the most fun that people have from adult all the way down to, to kids and what we would do is we would drop these we would drop these uh, objects of different sizes uh, at various angles and various throwing rates into this bucket and you actually see everything that I'm talking about come true when you throw something on an angle like a ball bearing you throw it on an angle into the into the crater uh, surface that we made you see that it splatters out in all directions evenly with the light stuff. And then the heavy stuff tends to go in the direction that the impactor was going. So it tends to fluff over to the side that it was uh, coming in on. So you get the Aristarchus event, you know, where you, you know, with Aristarchus you actually have over here, you know, you have this, uh, this, this, you know, uh, fairly even spray of very light ejecta, you know, the ejected material, we call it ejecta. And then this is the heavier stuff that kind of got splashed out and followed the direction of the impactor, which came from this side to that side and hit here, you know, and kind of hit. And of course, it makes a round, uh, makes a round crater. Um, and that's pretty much the nature of cratering, uh, you know. And I think you would really like to watch the. Uh, <laughs> I think you'd really like to see the uh, the uh, crater impact class. That's a lot of fun. So much fun. Um, now, here's a little guy before we go. I mean, you know, and, and you're, you're going to have to just like, everybody will just have to leave the stream, you know, before I decide to quit because I'm just having too much fun. But this here is a, a, actually a, an old crater, and it was filled in because lava overflowed its rim and filled this crater in, see? And that is, again, part of the chronology, how we study the order in which things happened on the moon. And this is really one of those things. Okay. The crater uh, was made, 
and then its rim over here was not as high as the lava flow that encroached from somewhere else. Now, it wasn't from Copernicus. Copernicus came far later uh, because it happened after this entire lava sea was created, which is what flooded this crater. All right. So uh, that's just really, you know, the, uh, the study of that chronology is, is what astronomy is all about, too, you know. And I think that it's uh, one of those things that uh, you, you literally have to stare at the moon a while and just figure, okay, what happened first? What layered onto this? What layered onto that? Believe it or not, you can get so much information, so much information by just studying the order of events like that on the moon. It becomes clear to you how the moon was actually formed and how the craters formed like we see. You know, I talked about it earlier in the stream, this, this area right here. This area right here was an impact, obviously, and we know that it was a circular crater at one point, right? You can kind of see a little remnant here of the far side wall, but it's actually covered by this darker lava material, all right, which is really interesting. So the chronologies of how these all happened, you know, I mean, the, the color of the lavas and, and the color of the rock and everything, all depend on the rock itself, what it's made of. And I think that when we look at the, the differences and the different types of rocks that are on the moon and the different types of impacts that occur, the moon is just amazing, you know? Um, you know, it's just amazing for how many different types of impacts it has uh, that from very different speeds and, and energies and types of material. But anyway... Um, I am not going to cut into Paul and Keith on P&K Space Imaging. I want to thank Keith again. I know he's gone over there, and he's kind of being a little bit uh, crazy right now, setting up, I'm sure, <laughs> uh, pulling out what little hair he has left. Um, he has a lot on his chin. He's trying to grow a beard, I guess. Well, anyway, um, you guys have fun over in p and I'm going to maybe check in real quick over there. But I want to thank you all for joining me for this journey through the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Quick Map tonight. And... Um, We'll do it again, and uh, we'll do some other things too. I've got some other plans, and um, don't forget, you know, if you aren't already a member, uh, please do join Sky Tour live stream, all right, on, um, on on YouTube, and I would really appreciate it. Uh, you would enjoy it, and we're going to be doing a lot of uh, wonderful things uh, in the uh, observatory. Um, so I'm just writing a note here. I got to get my link. Uh, trying to do everything, isn't that great? Um, so if anyone, <laughs> here's what I'll do. I'll just go right out here and I'll just hit F11. <clears throat> okay. Let me do here. Let me go into this. Do F11. Go to Sky Tour live stream. <clears throat> All right. This is Sky Tour live stream. Okay. This is the link right there. Um, let me just grab it. Okay, right up here, that's the link at the top. All right, and so we take that, and I will now paste it into this uh, into this chat here. And then you guys can go subscribe if you haven't already, and I'm thinking many of you have, but this is it. <clears throat> so there you go. So anyway, I want to thank you guys for joining me. I had a ball doing this with you, and uh, it's just so, there's just so much to it. So much that uh, it, it almost it's a shame for it to end it seems sometimes but I will uh, I, I will be happy to uh, talk to you again about these things if you're interested and we will go and go and go and I'll leave you with the Lagoon Nebula here um, uh, if that's what we're seeing <laughs> so uh, this is the Lagoon Nebula that we shot in Sky Tour Livestream Observatory and I'm hoping that you guys will join us and really enjoy it, okay? We'll talk about all these things, like what are these dark objects, you know, stars are being born in here, planets are being formed in here, all these things. And then out of all of it, we're alive and we, we come into uh, existence. So, uh, from all of me to all of you, <laughs> I just want to thank you guys for watching and I will talk to you another night. Good night, all. <laughs>